One of the things they do is to cut up a molecule called amyloid precursor protein, or APP, to generate healthy signaling molecules. The way in which APP is cut is critical. Normally, APP is first trimmed by an enzyme called alpha-secretase, and one of the pieces is then cut again by another enzyme called gamma-secretase. The resulting molecules are non-toxic and are needed for normal brain function. But occasionally, a different enzyme called beta-secretase accidentally cuts APP before alpha-secretase can reach it creating the sticky toxic beta amyloid protein. Beta amyloid molecules tend to bind to each other, forming small clusters called oligomers and bigger stringy ones called fibrils that eventually coat the neuron and form plaque. In different ways, oligomers, fibrils, and plaques all disrupt normal neuronal function, leading to mental decline with age and eventually Alzheimer's disease. But what if there were a way to remove the beta amyloid from the brain? Healthy neuronal function could be preserved, and a major driver yeah, of Alzheimer's would be prevented. Okay, sure. So I think I'd be good. Okay. <laughs> so. Okay. Good morning, everyone. <laughs> the only one who answers is my boss. Good morning, everyone on the live stream. <laughs> He's like, good morning. Yes, I have trained him well. Uh, we'd like to welcome you all to day two of the Rejuvenation Biotechnology Conference. Uh, we'd like to extend our welcome to the 62 countries who are now streaming the conference. So welcome, everyone. And to answer the question, I have now gotten 172 emails about, yes, we are archiving the conference on YouTube. So if it's 3 o'clock in the morning, you can go to bed and watch it tomorrow. So not that we don't want you all watching today. We would like to extend our thanks once again to the Buck Institute for uh, hosting the conference. We really appreciate it. I think everyone here is having a wonderful time. So thank you all to the Buck. Hopefully there's someone here from the Buck. Uh, just a quick reminder, uh, we'd love to have people tweet. We, I know that we had people tweeting for us yesterday, and anyone at the remote locations, please feel free again to send me any questions at pound reg biocon uh, with that hashtag, and I'm monitoring Twitter, and we're happy to ans ask your questions to the speakers. I have one announcement to make. Uh, we're very excited about this, but um, some of you may know that we've been doing a crowdfunding campaign for our OncoSense project, uh, and we just received a $15,000 challenge grant. So we're announcing this today. We're extending the campaign by a month, but we need to match these $15,000, and we'd like to thank an anonymous donor and Christophe Cornijols, who is in France. So thank you, Christophe. Hopefully he's watching us this morning. Uh, so we'd like to thank you, and we encourage everyone to check it out. It's, you can see it at lifespan.io, or you can get information on our website, sends.org. So with that, I would like to bring to the stage Kimberly for our first panel. Thank you, Jerry. 
Morning, everyone. Thanks for um, joining us so early in the morning. I think the one thing that's good is that we have a panel of people that really are exciting and will at least keep you awake and make you happy that you got up early to get here. Um, what we're really talking about, I'm actually the director of regenerative medicine at Sartorius Stadim, a company that most people really only know on the bioprocessing side. But what we're seeing in the market is such a convergence between all of the technologies in the past for biologics now being brought into the regenerative medicine space. And so what we're going to discuss this morning is what we've kind of required from the teams out there, whether it be the research teams that are shifting into these spaces, the landscape itself that's changing with regulation and different paths to market, and then obviously the tool providers like Thermo Life Fisher um, uh, and Sartorius, and then the researchers themselves that are implementing these things. So we have three great speakers for you this morning. David Brindley, who you will see multiple times on the stage with so many affiliations, I will not mention all of them. Um, that we'll talk about the different areas, the landscape as it's changing, and regulations, and what we need to consider. Uh, Eric Roos from Thermo, that will talk about the technologies that Thermo has introduced, that will start addressing how to actually implement these um, changes and effectively use them to get products to market quicker. And then Jean Loring, who also needs no introduction from Scripps, a fantastic researcher who is now taking things to the nef next level and really requiring a different level of product quality. And so I will have each of them come up and do their presentations, and then we'll have a panel after and some questions. Thank you. David? for a panel which Kim introduced um, about the translation process to take lab-scale techniques, the research which is done here at the Buck and in the SENS Research Center, through the often long path towards first-in-man trials and then end market adoption. Ultimately, we want to be provocative, but also to make sure that you guys begin to understand the general principles which must be applied to take something from a scientific exercise into something which is a clinical and um, commercial one. Um, Eric and I both agreed that we're going to speak very quickly, so we can get to Gene up as quickly as we can. Uh, but until then, um, I'm going to give a background to really three things. Uh, one is the change in product complexity. So when we talk about therapies which are for age-related disease, Historically, they've pretty much fallen in the bucket of small molecules or enzymes. Now, we're really looking at approaches which are complementary to that, but involve stem cells and, uh, and gene vectors. And they have unique regulatory challenges, but also unique opportunities. To accommodate these new products, there's a series of new regulatory pathways which are flexible, they're adaptive, and actually these have fundamental impacts not only on the time to market and the amount of money required to get them to the market, but on the flexibility of decisions you take in the development path. For example, manufacturing. So historically, you would keep evolving your manufacturing process until the end of a phase two trial, at which point it's locked down. You can't change it, you're stuck with it for better or worse. But with these adaptive approaches, you're being forced to lock down earlier which is a blessing and a curse, you're getting to market quicker, but with a process which isn't necessarily debugged, if you will. Then finally, I'll wrap up with a small note about the interaction between manufacturing and IP, but for truly breakthrough therapies. There are a large number of incentives to increase patent life in order to reward companies for taking that long 20-year journey from research to clinical adoption. However, patents are the domain of the patent office and regulation is the domain of the FDA and never shall the two speak. Therefore, we have a few perversities which have arisen recently, which I think are important for you to be aware of,
but also something which, from a policy recommendation standpoint, we hope that you in the room today and those listening at home will help us change. So these are all the reasons you shouldn't believe a word I say. So first and foremost, this is the pharmacopoeia as we see it today. Small molecules are still the highest volume part of the healthcare market, but biologics, you know, monoclonals, are where pharma are making the majority of their money. But moving forward, the thing which we are really interested in are the regenerative approaches, the cell therapies, the immunotherapies, um, and the gene therapies. More futuristically, I know there's some guys from Wake Forest uh, in the room today, tissue engineering approaches also fall within this remit. Each of these has added an additional layer of complexity and an additional element of stress to the regulatory pathway because simply it wasn't designed to accommodate these therapies. But I am not from the school of thought which says the FDA should adapt immediately and they don't listen to us. I actually think the agency is incredibly responsive if we are willing to engage with them. And that is a joint responsibility at all stages of the pipeline, whether you're a basic researcher or somebody who's at the commercial applied end. And obviously the big elephant in all rooms at the moment is big data. What do we do with this data, not only from a pharmacovigilance viewpoint to support new product developments, but actually as we're moving to treating age-related diseases, where we treat chronic diseases or manage them over a long time period, or indeed give things which prevent the accumulation of damage, how on earth do you monitor the outcomes to ensure that pharmacovigilance and safety are looked after, but also make sure that the provider is appropriately reimbursed if it works or not. So post-market surveillance is a huge, huge uh, unmet need. Also, there's a few posters um, outside I saw yesterday which really talk about you know, tissue engineered approaches. Uh, there's a thymus there and, and any other organ um, you can think of. In reality, whilst incredibly scientifically interesting, these have a number of unique opportunities and challenges to get to market not least because they follow a, a, a leverage combination or path, if you will, where there could be a device and a transplant, a device and a therapeutic cells plus a scaffold. All these paths are established, but there simply isn't a lot of data uh, to inform our plans. So for those of you who may not be um, aware, to, to go from one side of a screen to the other is about 20 years, and there's about a 5% chance of getting from one side to the other. Our aim is to reduce the time it takes to get from one side to the other, to reduce the cost, and also to make sure that we take increasingly novel therapies from one side to the other. Where we are historically is that when we talk about manufacturing, where Eric and, and Kim come in, we, the process you have in a phase two is the process which you have when you go to market. So in a crude sense, here, when you're doing basic research at the Buck or in the Sens RC, you're culturing things in you know, 96 world plates or tea flasks. That isn't reproducible at an industrial scale. It's, a clo it's not a closed system, and the regulator doesn't like it. But it does the job perfectly well, because why do you want to go to the additional expense of closing it down? As we move through this process, this is where contract manufacturers would typically jump in and take the art out of the process. But Today, you can't sell your product and seek reimbursement until you have completed a phase three trial. Actually, the argument goes that if you've got all the way to a phase three, the product is quite de-risked anyway. If there's a high unmet medical need, why don't we simply let patients, subject to enhanced pharmacovigilance, access it earlier? Therefore, welcome to the era of adaptive licensing. Um, so the nomenclature you may have heard here are adaptive pathways in Europe or FDA breakthrough status. And essentially, it breaks the cl clinical trial path into three parts. In other words, making the, the clinical adoption of your science substantially closer. So after you've done your R&D, which you know, we, we all love and get lots of papers from, your phase one and two trials essentially are designed to assess safety and some efficacy. By doing a slightly larger phase two, the hope is that whilst you are conducting your phase three trial, you can get a conditional approval. So that allows you to get reimbursement for the product, improving your cash flow. It allows patients to get treated. 
And it also ensures that actually all the momentum built up by disease-specific organisations and patient groups is leveraged really quickly. Because anybody who's been through a trial will know there's tonnes of hype when you leave a phase two. Every patient group wants to work with you. And then all of a sudden, when you disappear into a phase three trial that costs $30 million and takes five years, everyone's disappeared as soon as you won't get to the end of it. So I think this point is really critical. Earlier controlled patient access. And this is a huge opportunity for everybody in this room, but actually this process has some um, nuances insofar as it's applied to age-related diseases. So if it's actually for a chronic condition and you're providing accelerated access, it may take some time for you to understand is that therapy working or not. But also if we're going to look at preventing the damage in a proactive way, Actually, how do you structure that study? What is your endpoint and when is your endpoint? Now, all this sounds quite theoretical, but I want to stress that actually this has had a tremendous impact on the rate of innovation. So in 2013, which I think is when these you know, conferences uh, moved out to uh, the West Coast, there were approximately 15 approved cell or gene therapies. A year later came FDA breakthrough status and adaptive licensing, and today, just in gene therapy alone, there are 18 products going through an adaptive path. A lot of these are for um, uh, cancers, but in particular pediatric uh, indications, um, ALL, etc. And the pipeline is incredibly strong. So you know, Pfizer alone, because of this path, have 14 uh, CAR-T products going through the pipeline. They wouldn't be doing this unless, A, there was a high medical need, but these regulatory incentives were in place, and I urge you all to look at them. So when we look at what are the big stories of the past uh, couple of years in this area, it's always the Novartis Kite, uh, Selectis, Junos, uh, Adaptimmune, and Spark, which crop up. All of these companies, their premise is built upon this process of FDA breakthrough status, getting their therapies to market quicker. So all this sounds wonderful, but actually, what are the key challenges which you guys need to understand and overcome to make sure your therapies go through this path smoothly and manage the risk to the patient? So in the US, a substantial pot of money has been made available by uh, the NCATS program, so led by Chris Austin, and this is really designed to get basic science to the clinic much, much quicker. And within there, there are specific provisions to encourage people to go down the breakthrough status route. However, a grant is a wonderful thing, which academics love coming around the, you know, the honeypot. But when you start to understand the regulation behind it, that's where things get slightly lost. So, Fundamentally, adaptive approaches are iterative. So the idea is you come into the top and say, well, is a conventional pathway already committed? So if I'm bringing something to the market for an existing indication, if I have a, you know, a, a blood pressure tablet, is that really a breakthrough? Is there a higher medical need? Actually, is this the best recipient? No. But then, actually, if it is something which is truly transformative, particularly for a, an orphan indication, then there's these series of feedback loops at every single stage of development. And that creates a lot of interaction between the regulator and the scientist, which people haven't been historically used to. But in the past year, there were 48 applications for this program, of which the majority were actually led by uh, um, academics. Of the 40 plus applications, 24 were accepted within a year. So this means that 24 products are in the pathway quicker than they would have been before. They've got access to funding they wouldn't have before. And in addition to that, their path to market is just a tremendous amount shorter. Now, for those of you that don't necessarily um, follow the space hugely, um, and I know there's some companies in the room which have some therapies like this, um, the doyen of the field at the moment is the, the joy of CAR-T. Essentially, taking a patient's cells in an autologous approach, the, a manufacturing platform, um, activating certain properties of the cells, and turning these immune cells into cancer fighting as opposed uh, to, to cancer honing. And in this process, the scale up is incredibly challenging. And it's something which most of the time academic investigators wouldn't bother about until they had an industrial partner. 
So you go through this process and you keep changing your technologies. You simply cannot change as much in an adaptive approach. But I will leave you with a little bit of the perversity which um, is now really starting to crop up uh, in the US. And it's the principle of patent exclusivity. So because it takes a long time to get to market, you can get a series of incentives such as supplementary protection certificates to increase the life of your patent. And any you know, patent attorney at the buck will be very familiar with filing these. But they are based upon the premise that it takes X years to get a product to market. And you must have a marketing authorization from the FDA. Adaptive licensing, which we're all loving and going after now, decreases that amount to a shorter amount of time. So you, you may not be eligible for these incentives. But also, if the marketing authorization is withdrawn, because it's conditional in a phase three, then the entire patent life can actually be shortened. So what we're seeing now is potential for negative term intellectual property. And um, I think yesterday, the, um, in one of the presentations, um, the new lobbying power of academic research centers was noted, and this is absolutely a key area. Um, there's two cases going on in the moment in Europe where um, for a CAR-T indication, so you know, a cell and gene therapy for a pediatric cancer, the patent has actually been shortened in length because the law was never written with regulation in mind. So I think the key message here is do not think that everybody in this room isn't part of the same team in trying to get products to market. But what we need to do is go from, instead of collaborating in new ways, which meant make sure you get a physicist on your team and a basic a biologist, we now need to look beyond to the other stakeholders and engage with regulators, and in particular tool providers, earlier. Because ultimately, and Eric, I'm sure, will cover this in a great amount of, uh, of detail and in a very erudite fashion, um, the tools which you guys need tomorrow, the need just went down from in three years' time to a year's time. And now the tool providers have got to accelerate their development pathways as well. So we need to be clearer in our lines of communication to achieve that. So long and short is there are new approaches out there. I think they are absolutely applicable to age-related disease, both uh, the, the, the prevention and the correction uh, of damage. I don't think that the regulation was written with this in mind, and I think it could pose one of the greatest challenges or opportunities to this regulatory pathway, perhaps other than, uh, than vaccines, which is always the case study uh, which is given. Um, if you'd like to hear any more, there's some posters outside, or I'm around um, all day. And thank you for everybody who's paid for the research, in particular uh, uh, um, to SENS. Um, and I changed the picture at the back because what a beautiful place it is. So thank you. <clears throat> Great, David, thanks so much <clears throat> for the introduction and thanks for uh, the Buck Institute for allowing me to uh, take some time here and, and talk a little bit about tools and technologies that are really, really critical for the development of some of these uh, technologies that we're all working on for various, uh, various indications. Um, it's quite an interesting time, no doubt. We've seen some, some exciting uh, developments occur in the, in the immuno-oncology space, which has really stimulated the cell therapy industry. And I'm going to be focusing more so in the cell therapy space than others. And I think the reason for that is that it's really going to be uh, uh, an interesting uh, opportunity for us to develop technologies and bring them forward. So as Dave was alluding to, the technologies that are currently under development by tools providers like Thermo Fisher and others in the industry are really uh, becoming accelerated as the need for further definition and further characterization occurs. And the reason for this acceleration in, in tools development is really to make sure that the filings that are, are uh, submitted to FDA when new ta technologies are, are presented uh, as part of CMC uh, uh, um, filings that the data sets that are there are really um, supportive of the type of therapies that are, are going on. I mean, we, we're developing technologies, again, as David alluded to, that are much more complex than therapies of the past. Single, you know, uh, 
ethical molecules, proteins, antibodies, and now actually living cells that um, react to their environments. So what I wanted to touch on is, is basically that uh, the re regenerative medicine is um, going to be part of the future. Cell therapy is going to be part of our future here. The complexity uh, of these types of drugs are increasing, and because of that increase in complexity, we're going to need uh, better characterization and uh, tools to control their manufacturing and, and, uh, and understand that uh, the efficacy is going to be critical for, for, uh, for future uh, administration. So the manufacturing is quite complex. The processes and materials that are used for the manufacturing of these absolutely affect. Again, this is a living drug that are, are being, uh, that are being um, put together for, for affecting biological outcomes. So any component or compound that touches that cell as a drug needs to have very in-depth um, quality control around it. So the, the need for innovative tools uh, is, is pretty self-evident. You know, as we start thinking of advanced treatments uh, in cancer and monogenic diseases and modifying genes, um, and also, of course, to, to affect uh, 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 aging, you know, we really need to think about how to best translate those. And translation is really dependent on the materials and processes that are selected to move these forward. So early translation is going to be the key for success, and, and the, uh, the ability to progress the realization of this vision is dependent on the selection of tools at an early phase. Again, as David touched on, um, lockdown of processes usually happens now in phase two, and if we're using these accelerated uh, regulatory techniques, we, uh, we want to make sure that the quality of the tools that are going in there are, um, are uh, adequate to support that kind of uh, uh, safety profile that's needed to, to get the uh, uh, folks treated with these, these uh, drugs. So hopefully today, as take-homes, we'll be able to understand the complexities involved with moving cell therapy into the clinic, uh, understand the importance of choosing materials and manufacturing systems and how they affect what you're doing, and then uh, I'd like to get some, uh, uh, provide some exposure to innovations that will help drive the development of cell-based therapies. So we'll talk about uh, the workflow and challenges, the importance of culture systems, quality, process, and delivery of these therapeutics to patients, and also the characterization tools and gene, gene modification delivery tools that exist today. So here's a, a, a slide talking about the, the cell therapy workflow. Uh, it's pretty complicated. You know, you have to obtain cells from a, uh, a patient, you need to be able to transit those cells to a processing facility. You need to receive those cells into that processing facility. You need to uh, then initiate your work, so isolate the particular cells that you have of interest. Uh, in some cases, you want to activate them uh, in some of these uh, immuno-oncology spaces, of course. Uh, you want to engineer them to have uh, uh, receptors that are going to be able to bind to, to particular cancer types, for example or to engineer them to, to uh, affect uh, diseases like uh, Duchenne's, for example. You have to expand those cells. You have to wash them. You have to fill them. You have to freeze them. You have to do uh, testing and characterization. And then you have to still distribute these cells from a, on a global basis. You have to store them, put them in planes, and ship them all over the world. So the, these poor cells that are, are sitting in, in our, in our uh, and our bodies are, are removed and are really, really taken through the ringer here. And, and it's our job to make sure that we have controls through, throughout this, this workflow. And, and that's, that's quite a challenge, really, because uh, anything that happens along this pathway could potentially affect the efficacy of this drug. So very, very important to keep in mind that there are many different uh, opportunities to uh, to um, have things go awry, so we need to really stay on top of all of them. So uh, I'm sure everybody's very well aware of this, and I think the purpose of this slide is really to, to demonstrate that cell therapy takes a long time. Development is, uh, is, it can take decades, if not, uh, if not longer. So a lot of the early discoveries by Carl June at the University of Pennsylvania you know, elucidated some of these mechanisms of, of uh, engineering a CD19 uh, chimeric antigen receptor into a T cell and then have the, uh, the success that they've been seeing that's now been duplicated at a number of different uh, laboratories and companies including Kite and Juno, et cetera. But the work that went into that really uh, was, was pretty substantial. And you know, the breakthrough of the year was in 2013 as, as elucidated here. 
Uh, and we're probably not going to see some of these technologies until another couple of years, uh, at least probably 20, 2017, 2018 at the earliest. So the, the, uh, the, the development of these technologies really take a long time. And the requirements for commercial success to allow these uh, to be, to be um, successful and, and uh, have industrial application and commercial success are pretty deep. So we can use the, the, the rule of threes here is, is where, uh, where we're going. So the, for a, a particular uh, uh, drug to become a commercial success, you have to have e efficacy, obviously. You have to be able to ma manufacture that at a, a cost of goods that's uh, appropriate from a commercial perspective. <laughs> And uh, I, I think Brock was, was um, uh, uh, um, relating to the, uh, the importance of reimbursement, right? Because unless uh, an insurance company is going to pay for, for one of these compounds or one of these drugs, um, it, it's not going to be a commercial success. So in order to affect those three uh, um, measures of success, the, the materials that are going in have to be very well uh, uh, controlled, organized, and, and, and understood, and, and managed for safety. So the, through the, the materials uh, um, that go into there, the raw materials manufacturing uh, process and uh, characterization tools are all very important for the development of, uh, of an efficacious and, and uh, uh, efficient, uh, efficiently manufactured product. Um, and uh, as part of the support of the raw materials, you have to make sure that you have the appropriate quality that they have a regulatory path and that your, your supply chain that leads to that selection of that raw material as an ancillary product uh, is there from a manufacturing process, uh, making sure that you have a scalable system, that you have control of that manufacturing process, and, and uh, if, if at all possible, to bring that towards automation uh, are, are, um, is going to be very important as you move forward. And from the characterization tools, uh, understanding or having those tools in, in effect to uh, demonstrate potency, purity, and safety uh, will all be part of the equation for, for creating an efficacious and, and uh, cost-effective product that can get reimbursed. So what is cell therapy about right now, and what are the factors that are important in, in driving and bringing one of these uh, technologies forward? Well, it's really about the biology, right? So the, the efficacy of your product is ultimately where you want to go. And, and uh, today, you know, we're, we're looking at a lot of tools that are out there and media systems, for example, that have been around for quite, quite a while, for, for uh, a number of decades in some, some cases. But we're discovering and, and finding that there are very specific subsets, potentially, of cells that might have a higher potency than has currently been, uh, um, uh, been worked on and been developed. So the Understanding of systems biology, metabolic pathways, and signal, uh, signaling molecules are going to drive the next generation of media development and manufacturing processes. And, and it's this understanding of the biology and getting to a very specific and potent cell type that uh, is going to allow the, the, um, the, uh, the, uh, the commercialization of these technologies to move forward. So the biology is ultimately important, but it's also uh, Quality is also very important of these raw materials. So you have to make sure that you have CMG, CGMP uh, compliant manufacturing for all the materials that you're using, testing and documentation, sourcing and understanding the levels of animal origin contact, for example, as all these materials are not going into the patients, but they're going to be ancillary materials to the product that goes into the patients. So understanding and working with partners that um, can provide that documentation to help with your CMC and, and control, control uh, manufacturing controls, chemistry manufacturing controls section uh, is absolutely critical as you're starting to move forward. And, and this is really, again, um, pointed out by David, was the, the initial selection of these tools uh, and, uh, and materials is, is, is quite critical for early phase development and translation. Then it's, uh, it's also about the process and scale, so developing technologies that will allow commercial manufacturing uh, have to come into, into effect. So again, media systems, specific um, process uh, uh, containers, uh, manufacturing systems, bioreactors, and, 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 and like, all need to be worked with in an integrative fashion to make sure that, that uh, the endpoint and the efficacy and, the, and, the, and the, the, the biology of the system you're trying to put together uh, will, will work. So, Again, the complexity of a living cell and the ability for that cell to adapt um, makes it that much more critical from a manufacturing perspective to choose the right materials 
to bring to bring a technology forward. So there's there's quite a bit of effort that, that has to go into process and scale considerations. And then finally, it's getting the therapy to the patient. Once you have a drug, a therapeutic, you know, you have to deliver it. And these are are, are you know ultra ultra um, uh, cold chain types of, of logistics that are involved. And and you know right now people are 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 um, doing extensive work in clinical trial support. There are a lot of challenges out there, and innovation will have to happen in this space as well as uh, you know current technologies for doers and, and handling of. Uh, of frozen components are, are probably not going to be able to support the future commercialization of a lot of these technologies. You know, the type of innovations that will have to be brought about, we're not really sure. I mean, it could be uh, from the perspective of, of delivery, you know, having drones that might deliver these directly, or other types of uh, technologies that, that <laughs> I'm joking, I love the drones work, but um, uh, other technologies that might relate to um, uh, uh, alternative um, technologies for, for preservation that might be room temperature technology. So these are, these are very important innovations that are going to have to get implemented in the next uh, decades for some of these technologies to be able to be delivered to the patient. So how do you know what happens uh, with your systems and, and how do you know when you have all these factors and all these, these pieces of the workflow interacting on a living cell that itself interacts with, uh, with the environment it's in, how, how do you know that you're where you need to be? Uh, it's all related to characterization. So the quality is, is one aspect, but also the ability to measure what you're doing uh, is absolutely critical. So again, applying a lot of the technologies that we're having and, and continuing to develop new tools to support this in the genomics area, uh, transcriptome area, proteomics, uh, and single cell biology are, are absolutely going to be, be critical to the definition of, of your product and, and uh, the ability to, to bring these technologies forward. You know, potency assays, uh, development of technologies in this area uh, are going to be critical. Flow cytometry and surface markers can be used, and I'm sure Jean's going to go into a lot of these technologies that she's applying today for her early phase clinical trials in the, in the Parkinson's field, but developing potency to make sure that your cell is going to do what you think it's going to do. Uh, is, is very critical. And you can develop potency assays by a number of technologies. Um, this particular example is, is talking about flow, uh, where, where immunogenicity is, is monitored essentially, essentially and that can, uh, you can look at the effect of uh, an immune suppression by uh, monitoring uh, surface markers through flow. Uh, could be one example of a potency assay, but we have um, a number of different opportunities uh, to, to look at technologies for, for other ways to determine potency. Uh, transcriptome analysis uh, could be very critical too, so looking at, at uh, um, uh, gene expression, uh, you know, taking samples uh, from a final product or, uh, you know, normally the, the transcriptome analysis would, would be taken over a, a, a number of cells. So what you're doing in that sense is getting a, an average of the different cell types in there. But if you're looking for heterogeneity, you'd want to take a much more smaller sample set. So some of these technologies are now looking at, at getting very small sample sets. As, a, as an example, this gene chip uh, technology can, can look at um, as few as 10 cells. So you can get an idea of the heterogeneity of your population and see how that might affect uh, e efficacy and clinical outcome. And again, with that type of information, you can then redesign your process potentially to select subsets that might be more efficacious or give you a higher potency. Uh, so again, uh, characterization is absolutely critical. Uh, single cell analysis, again, breaking it down and trying to understand what's happening at the, the cell, uh, cellular level and, and trying to get away from, uh, from that um, overall uh, average group uh, is, is quite important. So there's a number of technologies that are being developed uh, at Thermo Fisher, but other places as well, of course. Uh, again, taking advantage of um, looking at gene expression and protein expression as, as potential um, effectors of, uh, of clinical outcomes. Uh, multiplexing assays, uh, using ELISAs, uh, trying to get as much information as you can out of a single, single sample. Of course, these are, are absolutely critical, again, for maintaining cost of goods. These assays are not cheap to run, so if you can get more and develop technologies, if, if a, a tool company like, like Thermo can develop technology where you can multiplex and be able to run on, on a fewer sample or a lower, lower amount of sample, 
but get more information. And this is going to be beneficial for, for the industry as well. Uh, biomarkers, of course, uh, is an area where we'll start being able to really understand what the patient population or who the patients that will respond best to these therapies uh, and, and what kind of um, uh, um, patients will, will have that, the greatest response uh, based on, on biomarker and, and diagnostic tools. Because Again, th this is related to the potential for reducing cost of goods and increasing efficacy for for different groups, so determining um, and distinguishing between responders and non-responders. So a lot of this technology is being developed as well and currently used. Safety testing, you know, at the end, ultimately you have to make sure that your, your product is clean, sterile, free of mycoplasma, free of, uh, of endotoxins, so, so um, technology is related to that. There are a lot of older technologies but they're, you know, that are being improved upon, again, from an efficiency, uh, efficiency standpoint so that you can um, do these studies and assays quicker and more efficiently, uh, you know, either using PCR technologies or, or other uh, fluorescent uh, tests, for example, uh, that are coming out with endo for, for endotoxin testing. Uh, cellular analysis, we touched on the necessity for, for flow in, in many, many cases. Uh, technologies are increasing where you can, again, do higher uh, or lower volume sample analysis and get multiple pieces of information out using, uh, using some uh, of the new technologies that are coming out. And the, the list goes on. Uh, you know, live cell imaging, uh, automated cell content, high content analysis, again, very, very important. All of these technologies take a lot of time to develop. They're, they're not help, well, they are, uh, are, are very important and can be uh, designed to have the, the greatest reproducibility, but they're not the development timeline is not the same as developing a drug, so it's easier to develop these types of technologies, but they have to keep up with the, with the, um, with the pace of, of desired research. Protein analysis tools, we touched on a number of these, ELISA multiplex, uh, protoarray, protein, protein um, uh, based assays, and, uh, and mass spectrometry uh, as well. Very, very important tools, again, all of them being uh, um, uh, optimized and, and refined and, uh, and uh, allocated specifically for, for the, the generation and, and testing for, of cell-based therapies. Um, PCR systems, genome sequencing, again, to, to correlate with biomarkers to make sure that we can understand which patients might respond best. It's, it's very important to know um, what their, their, uh, their, genome, uh, their, their sequence, uh, well, their, their genetic makeup is so that they can uh, be affected the best. So that's on the tool side, but um, more from a characterization point of view. But then there are other types of tools that are being generated and, and used in, in industry today. So, you know, gene editing, again, very, very important. Brock alluded to uh, CRISPR therapeutics, for example, that's moving forward. And we've heard uh, uh, announcements of, of Sean Parker trying to, to, to um, uh, get into the, the gene modification CRISPR business uh, very quickly with, with some activities at, at UPenn. Um, the understanding of this technology is, 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 is while well, this technology is, is highly complex, and understanding the, the critical components and being able to uh, provide the, the tools that will allow for these, for these um, uh, gene editing techniques to go, uh, to move forward is very, very critical. I mean, we've got uh, a, an iterative uh, growth in this market, but now with, with our next gen uh, genome editing with CRISPRs, uh, we have to make sure that the technology to manufacture the components that go into that will be of a quality level that will be able to support clinical evaluations. Um, lentiviral <coughs> production is another area, again, with an eye towards uh, driving these technologies forward, uh, looking at alternative ways to, to produce uh, lentivirus for, for the CAR-T space, again, um, is quite important. So there's technologies that are now uh, being able to get titers that are uh, actually probably twice what we show here uh, in suspension culture. So you're, you're making the processing and manufacturing of these components that go into the, the cell therapies that much more efficient, thereby cumulatively reducing cost of goods. Uh, again, indicators of, of technology development um, as the, the fields move, moves forward. Electroporation, a lot of it is very simple uh, at this point, at least uh, from, from uh, uh, early phase research type devices. Uh, but Getting this to a larger scale is very actively uh, being pursued uh, as well to, to have GMP opportunities, uh, GMP uh, devices that, that can uh, 
provide the flexibility to people to do large-scale uh, electroporation. And then non-viral uh, gene delivery technologies are also being worked on too. So again, being able to look at uh, gene modification without the need for, for, uh, for lentivirus and other, other types of technology is where the industry will be going. So at Thermo Fisher Scientific, you know, we, our mission is really to make sure that we can provide the industry with very high quality products that can be used in the translation of early discovery into early phase clinical trials. Uh, we take that very, very seriously. We have a very deep uh, quality system and a very deep quality uh, group as well as regulatory support to make sure that our sourcing is at the highest level so that the uh, development of these technologies can have the confidence in the materials that are, are being purchased from Thermo Fisher Scientific. And it's the, our breadth of capabilities are, are, are really uh, quite a, a, a extensive too. So we, we can bring um, to bear you know, a lot of those technologies I was talking about from a characterization standpoint uh, to be able to make sure that your, your cell therapies uh, uh, are um, being tested appropriately and that you'll have the data sets that will support and uh, allow for uh, uh, accelerated um, uh, uh, regulatory pathways. And uh, of course, we have a, a very strong focus in this area now, uh, very much uh, in support of, of what we're seeing in the industry. So we're very happy to um, be able to continue developing our capabilities and really look forward to uh, bringing them uh, to bear and working with uh, anybody that wants to move forward. So in summary, um, innovative tools to understand and drive the biology are being developed to support the cell therapy industry. It's a very active area. So we are all working very closely uh, with the developers to understand what their needs are and then take that information and understand how we can develop more efficient tools that will allow for the development of, of more pure and potent and uh, um, uh, commercially viable cell therapies. So the tools that are, are being developed will drive commercialization through manufacturing technologies uh, and product characterization. They'll, you know, these technologies will ultimately reduce the cost of goods of, of, uh, of the final products that are going to be developed. And um, ultimately, the development of novel and complex therapeutics will be enabled by, by the development in this space. So I think that's all I had for now. Uh, I think we have a fantastic follow-on to the type of things that I was talking about through Gene Loring, who's going to show uh, uh, specifically um, the application of some of these technologies and how she's using them to develop a therapeutic that is going into the clinic now. So thanks very much. <laughs> Thanks for, for upping their expectations. <laughs> I think I'll get a water for you. Yeah, it's going to work. Thank you. Okay, so um, a lot of what, hey, it's going by itself. Can you make it stop doing that? Hello? Okay. We'll just go back and forth. We'll figure this out. So um, what I'm going to talk to you about is a, um, is a specific application of a lot of these tools that are now in development. And it's not just the tools of biology that um, Eric talked about, but it's also the tools of, of uh, getting through the regulatory process that David talked about. These are all things that we need to take into consideration. Um, I'm not an expert in this, but um, it's amazing how fast you can become an expert in something when, when it's necessary in order to move forward something you really believe in. So I'm going to talk about the uh, techniques we've been using to um, do quality control using genomics technologies in a development of a cell therapy for Parkinson's disease. So our mission is to develop therapies for incurable neurological diseases. I'm going to tell you about Parkinson's disease, but we're also working on multiple sclerosis and Fragile X syndrome, which is, uh, we're using as a model for autism. Our highest priority in all of these projects is to characterize the cells. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, we want to know what is in the culture dish. We, wanna, we want to know everything we can about the cells at every single stage of development. And that's not really trivial. We've had to develop a lot of assays ourselves, and um, we have a pretty high bar. So we want to know whether they're the right cell type. That is, we're not, we don't want to put a cell that won't work into a person. And we want to find out whether they're normal, whether they're going to have any opportunities to become cancerous, for example. 
uh, because any one of those things, if it goes wrong, is going to be uh, devastating, not just to my project, but to the entire field. Okay, so um, I'm sure you all know this, but there are a few of you who haven't been, um, in, haven't been involved in this as long as uh, others of us. Um, the cells I use are pluripotent stem cells, and they originally were derived from embryos in 1998. These are um, just five days after in vitro fertilization, using methods that had been developed in the 80s for mouse cells, so mouse pluripotent stem cells, which have been enormously helpful for um, making animal models and understanding development. But in 2007, um, Shinya Yamanaka published a technique for, it, for using another method, which is called reprogramming, um, in which you could use any cell type, essentially, a skin biopsy from a volunteer, um, growing up dermal fibroblasts, and then reprogramming them into pluripotent stem cells. <clears throat> and a lot of the work we've done has been in showing, demonstrating, I hope without a shadow of a doubt now, that um, iPS cells, induced pluripotent stem cells, are in fact the same as embryonic stem cells, as remarkable as that may seem. Okay, so when you, when you um, are working with pluripotent stem cells, there are enormous opportunities, and this tree represents all the, a, a few of the things that these cells can become. So that means that you have cells in a dish that can become any cell type in the body. And the hard part is to make them become the cell type that you want for a particular therapy. So in this case, um, we're developing dopamine neurons in order to do a cell replacement therapy for Parkinson's disease. So the idea is to replace cells that die during Parkinson's disease. Um, I'm not worried about the cause of Parkinson's disease. I'm not worried about slowing down the, the disease. We focus only on trying to reverse the disease. So the strategy, this is the um, substantia nigra right here. It's very small. Its target is up here. This is a striatum, a couple of structures that are known collectively as a striatum. So we make induced pluripotent cells from individual patients. <clears throat> we generate uh, from those dopamine neurons and then we transplant them back into the patients. That's what our plan is. It's really very, very simple. And we're basing this on um, historical success using fetal tissue. So in the um, early, in the mid-1990s and the early 2000s, <clears throat> the NIH funded um, two um, double-blind trials using fetal cells. Now, uh, the fetuses that people used in these, for these studies are really small. Um, a, the human fetus that is uh, used for this um, kind of work is about six weeks to 10 weeks old. And they physically dissected out a tiny bit of the brain right here in the ventral part of this developing brain that included the part of the brain that was going to become the substantia nigra. So I wanted to point out that I actually have deliberately shown that when you cut a piece of tissue like this out, you don't just have one cell type. You have all the stuff that's going on in that, in that brain right now, <clears throat> including blood cells and things like, I mean, it's actually quite interesting. It's very complex at that stage. Nevertheless, when they put these cells into the target region, the substantia nigra, or the uh, striatum, um, in some cases, the, uh, these patients recovered and never required drug treatment again. So that's the remarkable part of it. The problem was that in a number of cases, um, too many in everybody's estimation, um, there was a dyskinesia that occurred, which was, um, is pretty frightening because um, it makes people sicker than they were before. It gives them another problem that is worse than Parkinson's disease and harder to treat. And um, so that's really why this closed down. It's, uh, this therapy has recently been rejuvenated by a group in Europe. They've started clinical trials doing uh, the same thing, essentially, trying to do better quality control than was done in the past. But they are using fetal tissue, so they're trying to reproduce more reliably this work. Um, it's a group called TransEuro. This demonstrates, just want to show you that there's, um, since these were done so long ago, and the patients have aged and, and died, 
um, it's been possible to look at their brains and find out whether those cells were still there. So in the, in the patients in which they were, in fact, um, essentially cured of the disease, the fetal tissue, the fetal dopamine neurons are still there, at least 14 years in this case, but up to 20 years after the transplant. And one of the interesting characteristics, which is just shown in this little bit here, is that they continue to improve with time. So even over a very long period of time, these people, instead of getting worse, get better. So when it works, it's really remarkable. So here's the problems, though, the things we learned from these fetal tissue transplants. Um, the main issue is quality control issues. Um, it's very hard. Uh, you need three pieces, three fetuses per side for a transplant. And it's extremely difficult. These um, embryos are very fragile, and you usually, even if you have the best of conditions for an abortion, um, the embryos are pretty um, chewed up by the time you get a hold of them. It's very hard to get the right piece of the embryo. They're not intact. So they have to use multiple fetuses, and the fetal tissue of viability, and in, in fact, the exact area of the brain that you can dissect, is quite different for each fetus. So each patient is not going to get the same cells as the next patient. And then there was the predicted, unpredicted uh, adverse outcome, dyskinesias, which has uh, struck fear into everyone's hearts in this field. And um, the, of course, it's kind of difficult, especially in the US, to do any therapy using fetal tissues. These aren't fetal cell lines, these are fetal tissues, so they have to be harvested from the fetuses right before you do the, the transplantation. Um, luckily, there has been some information about uh, that, that supports the idea that contaminants were responsible for the dyskinesias. And so, that means that now that we plan to do cell therapy instead of fetal therapy, we can deal with those issues of uh, quality control. We can know what cells we have in the culture dish and know what cells we're putting into patients. So the, the, uh, the advantages of making dopamine neurons from iPS cells is that you can analyze them and analyze them a lot before you put them into the patient. You can put the right number of cells into each patient. So you can put the same number of cells into each patient. Uh, we're not going to include any of the neuron types that cause dyskinesia. That's one of our quality control measures. There's no ethical issues with using patients' own cells. And I think probably one of the more important things is that there's no requirement for immunosuppression because these are individually made from each patient and they go back into that patient. So in a lot of ways, this is, is analogous to the CAR-T therapy in which you use a patient's own cells with all the problems and the advantages. Okay, so our, th our idea was to um, get a cohort of people. We have 10 Parkinson's disease patients. This is uh, pictures of eight of them here in this uh, slide. Uh, we've put a lot of effort into differentiating the cells reproducibly from each cell line into the same population of dopaminergic neurons. We've had our, our first FDA meeting, a pre-pre-IND meeting in February. We're planning to have our pre-IND meeting um, early next year, and you know it's a little hard to tell what's going to happen after that. Uh, but we're doing everything we can to make this as efficient as possible and hope to be in the clinic by 2018. Okay, so now I'm going to show you a series of slides in which we've tested every aspect of the process, and we've developed quality control assays that are not required by the FDA, and keep that in mind. This goes way beyond anything that the FDA requires. And I think this is really important because we also are interacting with the FDA, and we're hoping that we can convince the FDA that they require more stringent uh, uh, quality control than they currently require. Um, give, wish me luck. <laughs> okay, so I've, I've identified four parts of this process. Uh, the first one is when you reprogram the cells, then you need to expand them in order to make enough cells so you can differentiate them. We don't need a ton of cells. Um, we only need about a million cells, so we're not talking about bioreactors. We're talking about six well dishes. Um, so that's a real advantage of Parkinson's disease. We don't require um, a lot of scale up. It's also the advantage of autologous therapy because each patient we only need X number of cells, just that one time, or maybe two times. Okay, so let me tell you what we've done about each one of these. And this isn't in chronological order, but 
We've been sort of filling in the blanks as we go. <clears throat> okay, so let's look at reprogramming first. There's been a lot of uh, discussion about how reprogramming might introduce cancerous mutations. Um, there's been a lot of papers published on how a particular reprogramming technique is safer than others. And so we decided we would just ask whether it made a difference how you reprogram the cells and whether reprogramming the cells would cause any cancerous or cancer associated mutations. And um, the answer is no, it doesn't. We did, um, we did a huge um, study. Here we go into big data. We did whole genome sequencing of, um, of, of replicates of three different reprogramming methods. We use the classical method, which is to insert viruses using um, lentivirus, retrovirus. We used uh, Sendai virus, which is a product from Thermo Fisher and does not insert in the genome. And we used uh, messenger RNA, which is a transient expression of the, of the factors. And this paper just came out at the end of last year. Um, actually, it came out this year, sorry, February this year. And um, it is data rich, and the conclusions are unmistakable. That is that we found, um, we did not find um, cancer-causing mutations. And I, I deliberately collaborated with uh, a colleague from the Craig Venter Institute because they know more than anybody else, at least in my um, environment, about um, what mutations are of concern for cancer. So we got a clean slate. We, um, we are not certain we're going to keep checking, but we know that we can, also, we can now focus some of our concerns in, in other directions, in other, other stages of the um, development. Okay, so um, the next issue of inequality control is to know that you have pluripotent cells that are normal in a culture dish after you've reprogrammed them. In other words, we're now looking at sort of functional assays for them being pluripotent. There's no point in continuing if the cells aren't going to be able to develop into the cell type you want. So the, the first thing, and I think this has probably been the highest impact of our, of our work in this area, has been to develop a bioinformatic assay for pluripotency based on gene expression profiling. Uh, we call it pluritest. And it's a diagnostic test for pluripotency. And it, it has worked out simply because it's simple. Uh, we wanted to have the equivalent of an iPhone app for pluripotency for cells. And this is the closest we could get. Essentially, you create a gene expression profile you upload the data without any analysis to our website, and you get a, um, a, a report which includes a, a diagram like this, which you can put straight into your publication. That's what people do. Um, the idea was to, um, we started with 400 pluripotent stem cell lines that had been tested by the other method, which is um, a teratoma assay, which uses a mouse um, and shows that the cells can differentiate into all three germ layers. And we, uh, we, generated we generated gene expression profiles for all of those, and we developed a model. And now what we're doing in the, with this algorithm is looking, how, looking at how similar those um, cells, these queried cells, are to our model. And that's where they map here. There's a pluripotency score, which goes up here. And there's a novelty score, which um, accounts for other cell types, but also you can end up with cells that are pluripotent but abnormal. So this has proved to be extremely popular. A lot of mice thank us for this. Uh, we think we've saved something like 14,000 mice this way. Um, we now have 776 registered user sites in 29 countries. Um, and as I said, we have 14,500 around now data set uploads. And they continue to be used every, almost every day. Somebody uploads a data set. We licensed it to Coriel in January so that we could have, uh, we could step back and do some other things because we've maintained this ourselves. Um, that, we don't know yet how long we're going to be doing that license. We kind of liked controlling it ourselves, so we may end up doing that again. Or we may end up licensing it to somebody else. The point is, it's been really effective and very popular, and it has saved a lot of work for a lot of people working in this field. Okay, the other um, issue about um, iPS cells is whether they have, uh, their epigenomes are, are correct or not. 
And uh, I'm going to tell you right away that the answer is no, but we don't know whether it matters. So we did a, another very large study on using, we always use hundreds of cell lines if we can. Um, our sequencing paper, just because it would cost too much, we had to use tens of cell lines instead of hundreds. But generally, as you see from the author list, we get cells from everybody we can, we can possibly. We want to know what the breadth of variation is among pluripotent stem cells from all over the world. So what we found, we used a, a DNA methylation um, assay that's based on an Illumina chip. Um, and we could look at, uh, we could now look at 450,000 different sites of the genome and ask their methylation status. Um, so what we found was that um, there, wasn't, there were only a couple of things that were different about iPS cells from somatic cells. And they might be important, but so far we can't figure out how they're important. One is if, there's, uh, if you're reprogramming female cells, there's a high probability, you know, you have one active X chromosome in every, because there's X inactivation in us, um, in every somatic cell. When you reprogram them, the second X chromosome almost always becomes active. Now, we don't know whether that's going to affect therapy or not. It doesn't affect differentiation. It doesn't affect any of our downstream assays. Uh, the other thing that happens is imprinting is lost. Now, imprinting is the expression of certain genes by either the maternal or the paternal, um, by those, the alleles. And that just goes out the window. So we don't know whether that remains important for differentiated cells either. So those are things we're keeping in mind as we go forward. But for now, we don't see any reason why. I mean, the, the main point is that we check. Check your cells. That's the point. Characterize them. OK, so we have the pluritest assay. I'm going to give iPS cells a green light here because we have the pluritest assay. And we are, it's very easy to do DNA methylation profiles. So if anything untoward happens, we will know at this stage later on if it affects the outcome. OK, so here's the expansion phase. Now, this turns out to be the most dangerous part. Um, and the reason is that if, when you have cells growing in a culture dish, there is selection for cells that grow better or that resist um, getting killed. So in that sense, it's very much like evolution in the Galapagos Islands. And I think about my incubator with all its dishes in it as being the Galapagos Islands. Something different is happening in each one of those dishes. They're evolving differently. So um, we asked whether um, iPS cells are epigenetically stable. This refers back to the same the paper I just talked about. The answer is not really. They do change as I, in the ways I told you about. So are they genomically stable? Um, this is the paper we published a few years ago um, doing a copy number variation analysis on, again, hundreds of cell lines as they grew in culture. And we discovered that um, there were some things that would go awry. We found that there was, would be duplications of particular genes over and over and over again. Uh, with, and they acquired, those duplications are acquired with time. The cells start out OK. One culture dish might end up with one duplication. Another culture dish of the same cells could end up with a different duplication. Okay, The Galapagos Islands. We also found something that was kind of um, alarming because we were working on methods that we, um, developing methods so we could in enhance the stability of the cells and culture over the long term. And we discovered if we grew the cells for a really long time, like over a year or so, but it's in some ways this is um, equivalent to what other people are doing with these cells, we started seeing mutations that are clearly um, associated with cancer. In this case, it was deletion of P53 which, as I'm sure you all know, is, is a common uh, characteristic of uh, virtually all cancers. So things can go very wrong. And so you have to monitor the cells often in order to make sure that they're not going awry. OK, so uh, the answer is uh, they're not necessarily genomically stable. Um, there are selective pressures in different dishes that leads to fixation of mutations, and in fact, we sometimes get mutations of p53, which is alarming. Um, so I've given expansion a sort of um, half green, half red uh, indication to show that there, this is an active area in which we have to monitor the cells closely. 
Okay. So what are we doing about uh, differentiation? So this is uh, now into the, the part in which uh, we are, we want to be compliant with the FDA, but we also want to be, to have a higher bar than they require. So what we've done, this is our plan. Um, we start with the IPS cells and we do these release criteria. We have to show that the cells are, have a normal gene expression profile, that their epigenome is acceptable within limits. And we also do whole genome sequencing on them to make sure that, because there's no other way really to detect things that might be bad. It turns out none of these things are really hard. They just require like a, a very large terabyte server and people who know how to do bioinformatics. No problem. Um, so that's one checkpoint. The second checkpoint is a, a median point at which there is an early stage of neural induction called uh, floor plate induction. And after 11 days after we start the differentiation protocol, we do the same things again. And we're developing a, um, a pluritest-like test for this intermediate stage. So the pluritest test is based on looking at hundreds of samples. So we're acquiring the samples that we know are, by other criteria, and in this case it's that they differentiate correctly, are the cells we want. And then we're gonna create an, an easy assay so that we can always, we can check the cells quickly. We also can freeze the cells at any of these stages, which is really important because we need to put them away while we analyze them. Um, the stage at which we transplant the cells is 25 days, and they are immature dopaminergic neurons. The reason we use immature cells is because if you try to dissociate the cells in order to transplant them, you break off their axons, you have enormous cell death. So we want to pick them at just the right stage. We want them to be just about done with their differentiation, but not quite. They haven't quite gotten these elaborate processes that they form in culture. So we're developing another test, which we call uh, the dopamine neuro test, um, which is based on RNA sequencing or another assay for gene expression, whole genome expression. And then we do the epigenome and the genome again. Now this is really important because these are the cells we're gonna put into people. So we wanna make sure that the cells pass all these tests as well as the things I haven't mentioned like that the FDA requires like, um, like fax analysis. Uh, we do, um, we do not only, we don't, we not only do whole genome sequencing, but we use another method, SNP genotyping, to make, to get a quicker um, idea of what's going on in the cultures. And then we take the cells further beyond the transplant stage until they're more than 60 days old, and then we can use electrophysiology to confirm that they're the right kind of dopamine neurons. So this profile, um, here, shown in the electrophysiology uh, this little diagram here, is, um, is typical of, of do this particular type of dopamine neurons. Um, and this is based on, on slice cultures from mouse. So as far as we know, this, this is a signature of, of this particular type of dopamine neuron. There's lots of dopamine neurons. We need to have the right one. So we're also working at this stage on single cell biomarkers. Um, we want to find out, and it's actually kind of easy because when you do a patch clamp on a cell, you just suck it up into your pipette, and then you do RNA sequencing on the, what you get. These are the two people who are involved in the leader leading this project. This is Andres Bratlial. He's the director of the Parkinson's project. And um, this is Roy Williams, who's our bioinformatics expert. Um, Roy's been working with me for uh, I think it's 11 years now, so we've sort of grown up together at this, in this space. Okay, so to, to summarize, um, ensuring safety is the highest priority, and the most important thing is to characterize the cells. And there, this is me on my soapbox, um, yelling at everybody whenever they give a talk, um, talking to the FDA, talking to whoever it is, or listen to me, that you have to know what's in your dish, and you have to use, you, there's no, there's, there's no assay that you should just skip um, because you can't do it or you don't understand how to do it. You need to find out. Okay, so I just want to turn very, in a very minor way to the issue of funding. Um, we've had a lot of funding from CIRM. This is a list of the grants that we've used to develop the gene expression profiling, the SNP analysis. You notice that a lot of them are um, defining pluripotent stem cells, um, 
uh, ensuring the safety of cell therapy, um, developing new assays, and, um, and doing sequence analysis. And CIRM has funded all of this. But the most important funder of all this research, and this is um, unique in, in, I think, everyone's experience, is the Summit for Stem Cell Foundation. Let me tell you a little bit about them. So they started in, um, this, this is a nonprofit foundation that was started in 2010 when I met with uh, the head of the Movement Disorders Clinic at, at Scripps Clinic, which is across the street from us. We're not affiliated, but they're, um, they're both called Scripps. Um, so they came over and asked me whether there might be a stem cell-based therapy for Parkinson's disease um, for her patients. And I said yes, because it wasn't that difficult to think about this. It's, it's pretty straightforward, simple. Uh, the details, of course, are a little higher. But we didn't have any funding, so I said the, the problem is the funding, because I'm not going to get NIH money for this, and even CIRM is not going to fund something that's this speculative at this stage. So in uh, 2011, Sherry Gould, who's a nurse practitioner, uh, took 15 people up to the top of Kilimanjaro, and three of them had Parkinson's disease. So by doing that, uh, they raised $300,000, which was the amount we decided we needed to initiate the project. Um, that's why it's called Summit for Stem Cell, in case you're wondering. So we've had lots of fundraisers since then, and when I say we, I really mean them. It's been an amazing group. Um, they've had, uh, they sponsored concerts, there's been private dinners at uh, chef's houses, um, asking for, just asking people for money, social media. Uh, they climbed to the base camp of Mount Everest. Again, there's a movie about this. It's pretty cool. Um, you can see people with noticeable tre tremors walking up these rocky paths. There are people with Parkinson's disease who made it up to the base camp of Mount Everest. And they're planning this fall to uh, trek to Machu Picchu in Peru. Over the last five years, they've raised more than $3 million, and that has allowed us to get to where we are now. Um, we are, there are thousands of donors worldwide. We have donors from Australia and Europe and Asia, as well as the U.S. Um, they've done a remarkable job, and they continue to work on this. Meanwhile, we finally received our first CIRM grant to support this project because we had finally had enough preliminary data to convince them that we knew what we were doing. But we couldn't have done that without Summit. And I just want to close by showing the the people again, these are the patients that we've, um, we've derived IPS cells from. These are the people that we're planning to treat. And um, having the patients involved has been a really remarkable experience. They come to our lab, I think. Um, Dane's probably met them, my intern. Um, they come to my lab, they're involved in the fundraising, they understand the science. They, it isn't beyond them at all. They have, uh, they have no problem explaining it to other people. And that's made a huge change in the way that it's not only allowed us to raise money, but it's also allowed us to educate people about what a real stem cell therapy looks like. And that's important because there was a recent um, report that the number of, of unregulated stem cell clinics, that is people who use fat cells, for example, or bone marrow mesenchymal stem cells to treat autism or Parkinson's disease, has risen to 570 in the U.S. alone. There's nothing, there's no FDA regulation of this at all. So it's very important for us to also educate people about what kinds of stem cell therapies work and what, stem, what kinds of stem cell therapies are un unlikely to work and might even be dangerous. Okay. Thank you. Thanks, Jean. Um, Eric, David, would you like to join us back up here and we'll go through a panel. Um, that's some really fantastic data, um, Jean. And as we discussed kind of in some of the pre-conference discussions, um, one of the things that you were discussing was the fact that, you know, are other labs doing the same type of work? Are they really investigating at the mm -hmm. level to create assays to be able to characterize to this level? So I, there, there are examples. I mean, I go to a lot of conferences. I went to... Um, the International Stem Cell Meeting in San Francisco, ISSCR, just this summer, and I went to a clinical translational program, which was at the beginning of the conference. And 
I couldn't believe how many people stood up and said, okay, we're, we're working with the FDA, we karyotype the cells. And I thought, why don't you do something more than karyotype the cells? And they would say, and they said, two of them said, that's all the FDA requires. And so that's, you know, that's essentially all I can do right now. Um, I, can, I can lead by example. Um, I can explain to people that this, none of this stuff is all that hard, and, and it's going to save us a lot of trouble downstream. Um, but that doesn't mean that people are going to abide by it, because ultimately they don't want to invest in anything that the FDA doesn't require. Um, I think part, part of the, um, the, the challenge here as well is it's probably absolutely fair that that's all the FDA want to see, but to prove what? Mm -hmm. And I think that because people um, in basic research on the whole have never previously had to engage with regulation, then they wouldn't understand the difference between you know, developing a therapeutic or a, a laboratory-developed test. So consequently, I think that um, to support all the efforts which you're going through, I think there's a need to integrate some uh, basic product development into education, whether mm -hmm. that's your PhD program, a master's program, or whatever, it should be a part of it, because it's the narrative thread of product development. Yeah, I agree. I agree. And I think Thermo is probably uh, going to be a much bigger player in that space. Yeah. Don't you think, Eric? I, I do. <laughs> I do indeed, Gene. Uh, Eric is going to teach everybody. Well, yeah, that's, what I, that's what I asked him to do, and he said, sure. I think uh, what you're doing is fantastic, right? To be able to have more information and understand what your cells are doing. I mean, it's all about patient safety here, yes, right? I mean, exactly. we're, we're trying to develop technologies that are going to help people. We don't want to make mm -hmm. them, them more ill, of course. So the more information we have, the better we can make choices about the technologies that are going to be necessary to move these things into commercialization. So that's a great thing. Um, there always is the balance of what you uh, need to do from a regulata uh, regulatory perspective and what you should do from a, a development and research perspective. So that balance always has to be met. And what uh, happens often is that you will develop the technologies and validate towards more simple indicators potentially that will be used in your commercial manufacturing, but you have to have that underlying information and That's data right. set to be able to make those correlative uh, exactly. indications for, uh, for assays that you can use for release testing. So that's... Uh, yeah, and that was the good. idea behind Pluritest, was you can, still make, you can still get a lot of information. It costs $150 to do a, a, a gene expression array, and you don't have to know anything about bioinformatics, you just upload the data. Yeah. So that has led to um, adoption of that kind of assay, and it, it's, it's made people who've never done any genomics at all feel comfortable in using a test like that. So all along the way, we're, we're trying to make things easier for people to do. I mean, analyzing whole genomes is never going to be really easy. But there are so many people who can do it now. Yeah. You know, it's, not, it's no longer the, uh, the purview of, you know, like the five greatest labs. There, there are hundreds of places that can do really good gene, genome analysis. So that doesn't need to be a barrier either, even. And it's also cheaper now. It costs, um, well, it's theoretically costs $1,000 to sequence a genome. It actually costs like $1,500. If you actually, <laughs> if you can talk people down, it costs about $1,500. Um, and then you have the data. And then you always have the data. So it, it's remarkably, um, everything has evolved, I think, in that direction to make these things easier. And a lot of it has to do with companies like yours and other companies that do sequencing and, and other um, assays. Yeah, the, the information out there is uh, it's incredible. And being able to tie it all together to, to, to one of the early themes of, um, of this talk is, is big data. You know, the information is there, and how do you track it? There's incredible amounts of it, uh, and it relates all the way to, to patient delivery, mm -hmm. understanding, you know, which patient might be... Uh, oh, I agree. Uh, uh, yeah. We're I, sequencing I, the patients, too, right? you know? I don't know what that's going to mean, but I, if something happens, we have something to go back on and try to figure out why it happened. Exactly. I think it's also important to be positive about this because it, it, it's not that people aren't working with the FDA uh, because it's, they're being deliberately awkward. It, it's that the new therapies we have and the new tools we have, we simply haven't used before it, it, in such volume. So it, it, it's not that um, the momentum isn't growing, it's just that our expectation is possibly, uh, and that of patients in the market, is possibly outstripping our ability to deliver on that. Mm -hmm. um, and, and, and I think it's always good, as you did excellent in your presentation, to, to take stock and say, well, what have we learned? And please don't make the same mistakes. Mm -hmm. I've made them for you. Great. 
Exactly. Right, and I also think that there were technologies out there like mass spec, flow cytometry, where you know years ago it had to be an absolute specialist team within a university handling these things. Now with kind of the tech, tools and technologies companies out there making these things more accessible, making the data comprehension of that. Um, that is the one thing I was going to ask you. Do you see kind of that same bioinformatics interaction growing at Scripps, at other universities, at Oxford? Yeah, so I, I, learned, I decided a long time ago that I was going to do everything in-house. So <laughs> <laughs> because I've had, you know, even though I have lots of collaborators, I always wanted to be, uh, I wanted to be able to control the experiment so that I wouldn't have variables based on people's personalities, you know, that sort of thing. So we still do all our bioinformatics in-house, but I, as I said, I also collaborate with the Venter Institute. Those guys are really good. And I'd be happy to expand this more. It's just that it has to be, I have to trust them. And it's like trust that I have with reagents that I get from Thermo. I can't analyze them myself, and so there has to be a level of, of trust. And I think, um, I think, especially with big data, you need to, if you don't understand how to analyze it yourself, you have to trust the person who's doing it. And I, there doesn't seem to be a way of validating. Um, so I, I think there's sort of two approaches to that question. So, so one is the generation of the raw data, which you, right. G mentioned. But the second thing is then the analysis of that data. Mm -hmm. So I, I think even though you, you very fairly said there's now hundreds of labs that can do you know, genomic sequencing to a high standard, that's probably still fewer in number than the number of groups that potentially could analyze that data. Yes. Um, so to your question you know, about um, Oxford, I think Oxford has taken the approach that because Lucky Shing, the shipping magnate, gave them tons of money, they built a big data center, but actually they're using it to interpret other people's mm -hmm. data sets. Um, I think there's definitely a need to ensure that there's consistency uh, in the standards of, uh, of data collection and data analysis. And I don't actually think in genomics we're even at a point where the data collection is sufficiently standardized yet, let alone the data analysis on top of that. Um, and I think that if we look further downstream, and Jean, I think, very fairly but provocatively um, said, well, if we look at individual patients, what does that mean? Well, if we're using that to make clinical decisions, then there's got to be a very robust way of validating that. Um, and um, I think, Jean, I take you up on your offer of collaborating. Let's, uh, let, let's talk about that later. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah, and I think also one of the things I was going to ask was um, if you look at some of these kind of expedited pathways, is this data, I know you're saying you're talking to the FDA and hoping that's kind of going to push along your clinical trial and your, and your approval to get started. You know, are there ways, David, within regulation or within these expedited pathways that are accepting or are more open to if there is more data in those filings? Is um, that one of the... So, so I, I guess um, I'll give the academic answer and then the, you know, because I'm um, you know, a road between two thorns with you and Eric here, the commercial answer. Um, I, I think the academic answer is that, you know, almost all data is good data and the more we understand the richer the data set, the more conclusions we can draw. Um, I think the challenge when we look at an industrial setting is, well, once you have that data, you must interpret it in some way in a regulatory submission, and the more data you generate today is more data to analyze from a pharmacovigilance viewpoint moving forwards. And sometimes you don't necessarily want to do too much pharmacovigilance because you might find things you don't want. Um, so I think that um, it's very important to define what is the purpose of collecting this data. And I do think that as this blur appears between what is a trial and what is a product which has got a conditional authorization, there should be a church and state between this is development and this is um, product adoption and a clinical issue. Because if not, we're simply going to have people paranoid about doing further development. Um, and that's going to stymie the development of the product in the adaptive pathway, but also secondary products coming down the pipeline. Yeah, so my goal is to find out all that stuff that I don't want to know. Yeah, exactly. Um, but but I, I think, in a weird way, I, I said, you know, perhaps sort of too jovially, they don't want to know. No, Actually, we all want to know to reduce the risk. Right. The problem is, is that to that individual asset, it could be the death of it. So I, know. Um, so, so, so I think that for large pharma companies, actually, it's not too much of an issue. That risk can be managed in a portfolio approach. But if you are, you know, a, Kite, a Spark, a Juno, a Bluebird, all the companies which um, Eric and myself mentioned, which only have three or four, that could be really, really quite challenging. Um, so I, I do think a church and a state uh, is required. And I guess the analogy I'd use is, 
um, imagine that what you essentially have is two types of prototype. You have one which is a prototype um, which will support a future clinical product. And then you have a prototype today that is a living clinical product and everybody is aware of the risks it has moving forward. But I really don't think that having, unless there's obviously huge clinical issues found, I don't think there's a huge amount of value in taking conditional approval, supporting somebody to get more data and then taking it off the market. Because there's a balance between actually what can you learn out in the market itself. Right. Right, but at the same point in time, I think the thing that Eric and I come across very often is people that don't have as much information as Gene has, but start with a very manual process like we discussed, and then how do you shift platforms if you don't have comparability? You know, so Eric, I don't know if you kind of have comments as to the things you've done. <laughs> well, you know, I, I think these are, are really interesting uh, questions that we're asking, and I think the technology now is, is expanding to a rate where we're going to see you know, almost a, a Moore's law effect in, in, in biology, right? So, the you know the, the human genome project, and you know now you know the different technologies for, for doing next and uh, sequencing are, are so readily available, and only a thousand dollars, and you get your answers in what six yeah. hours, eight hours, I don't know, whatever yeah. it might be. That's just the beginning. So now we have the ability to capture that data. Now, what to do with the data is the next step, and then how to validate that data and start tracking. You know, we, we don't have the answers today. And to the point of what is risk versus not, I mean, knowing what there is and then doing a risk assessment later on or, or perhaps, you know, uh, understanding or finding out more information later from a clinical population, it's going to have to happen at some point. Uh, and the more information we have to go back to, which is one of the points that you were just making, yeah the easier it will be to understand what may or may not have gone wrong, for yeah. example, in a serious adverse event or adverse event. In mm -hmm. some, some yeah, really I, I, I think we also need to go from this culture of change control, implying it's a bad thing, to yeah. kind of change management, because actually the amount of times we're going to have to do change control uh, in a process is just increasing exponentially. Mm -hmm. It's really hard for, believe me, that's the hardest part when you're an academic, is to lock down a, an SOP. I mean, we just, we always know we can approve it. It's very difficult. Yeah, and one last question I would have, Gene. You know, one thing that you did point out is the funding that you received from CIRM, a lot of that being local, and then the luck of having an advocacy team that wanted to um, come in and invest. I think, you know, there are obviously other universities here that don't have the luxury of kind of local resources like that. Um, do you have any suggestions I don't feel like the luxury, for you know? them? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, this has been really hard fought. Um, even our first grants from CIRM, they said, why on earth do you want to do gene expression? What does it have to do with stem cells? I mean, every single one of those grants has been very hard to get through, and I've, I haven't gotten them several times. Because that idea of doing, um, it's just not, the study section, or the grants working group in that case, didn't appreciate it. So um, I think that, and at places like Harvard, I think, for example, I mean, there are, there, we're all different. We're lucky because we're in California, we have access to CERN money. But there are other places that have access to money like that. I'm, I feel sorry for the people in the middle of the country that don't have other, um, other sources of income besides the NIH and, I don't know, whatever, you know? So we have a, we're trying to do a distributed model in which we get funding from every possible source. So if we need to, we'll start a company and we'll get investment. But I don't want to do that until I really have to because I don't want to have to go through the issues of having to license a lot of, the, I want to use the best technology. I don't want to use the one that I can license for the least money. I, I also, one thing I found incredibly heartening about Gene's presentation um, was when you uh, mentioned about the Parkinson's patients and the fact they understood the science. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think for me, there's, you know, two, two you know, historic bones of contention. Um, one is that I think as researchers, we're wonderful at writing grant applications at a heady intellectual level, but then the people on the street who are actually paid for the research, if we don't do a job of conveying it to them, I think that's a little bit you know, immoral. But the second part is um, a lot of uh, grant making um, bodies, particularly for late stage translational grants, now have for say every eight academics on the panel, one industrialist and one layperson. Yeah. And you know, the layperson could be an expert in you know, assessing the properties of drone regulation or something like that. Mm -hmm. But actually, uh, unless we can convey it to everybody, then your grant mm -hmm. could get held up. I absolutely agree. I think uh, communicating the importance and exactly how it works, showing that it's really very simple and straightforward and 
get engaging people so they feel like, yeah, that's the way I would have designed it, even though I'm not a scientist. Yeah. Yes. Question? Sure. Oh, yeah. We have, about, we have about 10 minutes. Are there any questions? Okay. So with getting these technologies approvable in front of the FDA, there's really three st stakeholders you have. I've, I've got a whole new drug platform in front of FDA right now, and it's interesting to watch. I mean, a lot of these new expedited pathways and stuff are, are there so the FDA can act, actually make logical decisions about what to apply and what not to apply in terms of gating technologies. And I, I've been very enamored with those interactions with FDA. They follow the science very well. They're in an unenviable position. They're building the fire truck on the way to the fire uh, and uh, you know, have to make decisions on the fly. There are also obstructionist points of view that happen, and that mainly comes from this gigantic gaggle of consultants and advisors <laughs> that practice in front of the FDA who absolutely have no interest in having lower costs or less of their time, effort, and perspective involved. And they tend to hold you up and then really force the FDA into the mode of the other part of FDA, which is all the box checking. And there are many boxes that just don't have to be checked, in fact, make no sense to check with these new technologies. So um, the FDA science-driven part, great. The process suffers from all of this gigantic industry that grew up around it. As developers of new technologies and promoters of these expedited pathways, how do you handle this group? So I guess everyone's looking at me there. Yeah, uh, um, um, so I, I guess let me answer this from um, your very direct and I think pragmatic perspective, and then also as somebody who spends you know part of his life being one of those uh, unfortunate consultants you speak of. Um, I, and, and I think that you know from an academic uh, viewpoint, it's always much easier with an academic hat to engage the FDA because you have no vested interest other than progressing things forward. And I I will say that that's a blessing and a curse because. And contentiously, the quality of academic clinician-led trials is often far, far lower than industrial ones. And actually, if there was a way in which some basic principles could be applied, I think that you wouldn't have this end of phase one, start of phase two cacophony of trying to work out you know, where the noise is. Um, I think that the golden rule of regulation is if it wasn't written down, it didn't happen. And I think that all the box checking, as infuriating it is, is, is very, very important. I would always be careful about speaking about the consultants for two reasons. Um, one is that the majority of them are all ex-FDA or still sit on FDA committees. So you don't necessarily upset them too much. But also, it's fundamentally a communication issue. Because you go from a process where it's, uh, the nomenclature is scientific and it's emotive to something which is depersonalized and process-driven and insofar as possible, standardized. And I think that is the big challenge. How can we take really exciting, heterogeneous technologies that weren't really developed with the old regulator paradigms in mind and have an open dialogue to try and make them fit the box as best as we can? And there'll be a few jagged edges, but how do we um, do that? Um, I actually think on the consultant point, it's exactly the same as picking an academic PI for a trial. Make sure you pick somebody who understands both the regulatory pathway and the core underlying technology. Because what you don't want to do is have a scientific conversation in one direction and a regulatory one in another, where, as you said, they very much um, align. Um, I also think that you know, Gene is available to assist with these submissions, should you so require. <laughs> yeah, and I would actually say, you know, Eric and I struggle where we really are required to work and partner with someone who's bringing something to clinic. Because we really can't even have, as tool provider, conversations with the FDA that are too broad. We kind of need to understand exactly where it fits for them to make suggestions. And so it becomes even more important if you want new technologies in the market to really engage the tool providers to make sure that they understand what's being asked of them and are working within the compliance the FDA expects. Uh, the, the other thing I'd say from a slightly you know, utilitarian viewpoint as a healthcare community, nothing frustrates me more than science being held back by bureaucracy. But actually something which frustrates me slightly more than that is things like you know the theranostic situation where actually I think it's done a net disservice to the industry because you know it, it, I'm sure that in reality the detail isn't like this but it's perceived in the press as kind of riding roughshod over what they'd already been told and I think that just creates more uncertainty and more reversion mm -hmm. to innovation because then you go to investors and the first thing they say is oh are you another one of these and I think actually we need to remember that the decisions we take today affect you know 
our counterparts tomorrow. Yeah, and I guess I would add to that too, that even when we talk about the level of data that you have from something like what Gene's working towards, you know, that is what's really safeguarding that the patients are safe so that we don't have things that could end up shutting down entire programs like Sorry. the IPS programs or the new, the new successes that are happening with gene therapies. Yeah. Oh, thank you for the insightful information. Um, so regenerative medicine or cell, uh, stem cell therapeutics actually has become the horsepower, horsepower for um, delivering the precision medicine to the world. Um, um, thank you for sharing with us this amazing results we've generated from the laboratory. However, we noticed surprisingly uh, the preservation method which maintain the li uh, shelf life for all those live drugs is severely behind. Like the technology we use today has not been really changed in the last 50 years. All the labs around the world has to like, deal with toxicity and deal with the uh, circumstance generated from those solutions. So could you comment on that? And where do you see the future to standardize this preservation solution? to allow effective delivery for the drugs. Thank you. That was like Eric. Yeah, I think that's an excellent question. Um, <clears throat> I, I, I tried to touch on it a little bit in, in the presentation I gave, but you're absolutely right. The innovation in that space uh, has not really progressed very much over the years, and I think that's partially because the, uh, the, the requirement uh, has been less commercial, right? So as we're moving these technologies forward now, the need for, for larger scale, better technologies in that space are going to drive that innovation. So um, there are a number of, of opportunities to improve upon this. I know that Thermo Fisher Scientific is certainly looking at, at opportunities. There are other companies out there that are, are highly specialized in the cryopreservation space. There are, are technologies with, with uh, you know, free radical uh, uh, um, scavengers, et cetera, et cetera, that are, are used, uh, but again, that's still pretty basic technologies. These are incremental uh, improvements. Maybe you have you know, an increase in, in viability post-thaw by a certain percent, or you have a, a thawing agent that helps the recovery of these cells, and that's great. It's one step, but the innovation and the focus in that area is, is, is right. There, there are a lot of, uh, of opportunities for improvement, clearly. And, and the logistics of this, you know, drones or no, or no drones, is, is another big issue, right? I mean, cryo, ultra, ultra cold chain logistics is extremely expensive and inefficient. Uh, you know, biorepositories uh, are, are, are very expensive to maintain. I mean, that's what we have today, and that's the state of, of, the, of the industry, but it's going to have to improve. So. Um, you know, I thank you for the comment. I don't have much of a suggestion at the moment other than to, to certainly recognize that that's an important area for focus and innovation. Comment too. So we're, there are a lot of things I didn't talk about today. One of them is because we, we're, we're cognizant of the fact that, that a surgeon is not going to be able to manipulate the cells. So we have to cryopreserve them. We have to figure out a way for them to thaw them and get them into a needle in a way that doesn't damage them. We don't want any thinking in the operating room at all. We want, you know. So we've uh, done a, we've essentially tested the cryopreservation agents that are on the market. We focused on the GMP um, ones, um, and we found some that, that are extremely good. And the way we find them being extremely good is not just to look at the cells pre and post thaw, but to put the pre the post thaw cells into animals into our animal model and ask whether they work just as well. So. I thought that was going to be a much bigger problem. I'm still worried about how to make the surgeon do the right thing. Um, but, but I still, I don't think that freezing these cells, we, we can now freeze them at virtually every stage with really good results. Um, so not to dwell on cryopreservation, but I think just two dimensions to this problem. Um, one is that we're trying to cryopreserve cell types which we never have before, and that's an inherent variability and a bit of process development. But the other thing is that Actually, if you look in the industrial literature, we'll speak to you know, people like you know, Sartorius, Thermo, um, Biolife, etc. Um, cell banking of monoclonals, etc., which does require cryopreservation, has been around for years and is quite established. It's just that there's never been a need for researchers to have to bother before. So I think you know, reach out to your local charming reps, let Eric buy them a beer, and uh, find out all you can.
Yeah, and I think, again, there's another new area for innovation because you're now deciding, you know, things that used to be put into vials were really moving into, they're in thawing bags, they're in some kind of a freezer bag that maybe didn't have 510K approval in the past but now needs it. So this entire market is requiring a different level of regulation due to what the product is and how it's being handled in the hospital compared to the past therapeutics that are out there. Um, I do remind everyone, Mark Zimmerman and I had a conversation about this yesterday, that you know, 30 years ago, monoclonals were in a different space as well than where they are with a very fixed process and very well understood characterization of them. I think we're still in the early days, even though I think we'd all like to feel we're moving further along and things are moving quicker right now with more funding than we've seen in the past. We're still kind of in those early stages um, to getting to a point where it is a market and an industry that is more um, kind of more bespoke and, and more standardized throughout. Yeah. Okay, great. We have time for one more question. This gentleman's raised his hand five times. So. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, so my questions of a scientific nature for Jean. Uh, first of all, thank you for a truly exemplary work in progress from stem cell to patient, patient application. Um, I'm, you, you presented in, early on in your talk the impressive results obtained using fetal transplants in some cases to treat Parkinson's. Um, so in those cases where presumably there weren't very many serotonerg serotonergic neurons, right. but still a mix of cells. Yeah. I'm guessing it's because of the mix of cells that they did so well. Uh, obviously, yeah. as you know, in the, uh, the normal environment of these dopaminergic neurons, there are other cell types like vascular cells and mm -hmm. support glia and mm -hmm. other cell types. So I'm wondering in comparison what you might expect with your purified cell types, whether you'll get such long-term survival and improvement over time as the fetal ones, and if you've considered I know this would complicate a lot the, the pre-testing uh, that you need to do, but including other cell types like vascular precursors, because we're seeing in mice that when we use mix of cells, we can have large transplant sites that survive very long and do very well because they're much more normal in their cellular compositions. Yeah, yeah I, I've... Um... <laughs> So we've taken a, this, this has been a rather wandering path to the point where we are now. And early on, I really thought that it would be very important for the cells to be uh, with other cells that they appreciated. It turned out to be impractical for the, uh, the point of view of evolution of our, of our um, differentiation strategy, because it would be, we don't know what we want, so we had to, you know, we had to try to get more dopaminergic neurons. Now I'm hoping that they don't require those cells because they'll get them from the environment where we transplant them. Because obviously there are glial, glia there that are going to be nice and supportive, and there's, a, and you know, of course the, the it'll be on the other side of the blood-brain barrier, so there, um, and there will be, um, there will be all these other cell types there. But you know, the fact is we don't, that would be a great thing to do when we decide to improve this process after we either, I hope, see success with these transplants or unfortunately failure, that would be a, a really important thing to examine. I mean, my history in Parkinson's disease was, um, is very old. I mean, I, I first did transplants in this, the late 80s. And at that point, I did a, um, I thought I'd done an extraordinary thing. I, I took, um, I took uh, cells from rat fetuses and I grew them in aggregates and I transplanted them and found that they all survived. Now, I would love to go back to that, but it just isn't practical. I mean, I would have to do it as a, like a, a side project. So, yeah, I think it's absolutely, it's something we keep in mind, but I, I don't see a way to actually test it in any well, meaningful way. Well, thank you very much. That's all the time we have for this session. Uh, we're going to take a 15-minute break. So for everyone on the live stream, enjoy the videos. And thank you all so much.
the neurons in our brain are constantly active. One of the things they do is to cut up a molecule called amyloid precursor protein, or APP, to generate healthy signaling molecules. The way in which APP is cut is critical. Normally, APP is first trimmed by an enzyme called alpha-secretase, and one of the pieces is then cut again by another enzyme called gamma-secretase. The resulting molecules are non-toxic and are needed for normal brain function. But occasionally, a different enzyme called beta-secretase accidentally cuts APP before alpha-secretase can reach it, creating the sticky toxic beta-amyloid protein. Beta amyloid molecules tend to bind to each other, forming small clusters called oligomers and bigger stringy ones called fibrils that eventually coat the neuron and form a plaque. In different ways, oligomers, fibrils, and plaques all disrupt normal neuronal function, leading to mental decline with age and eventually Alzheimer's disease. But what if there were a way to remove the beta amyloid from the brain? Healthy neuronal function could be preserved, and a major driver of Alzheimer's would be prevented. Our immune system reacts slowly to new infections. And much more quickly to infections it has seen before. Its memory resides in white blood cells called memory T cells, held for years in a dormant state. When another immune cell alerts them that it has encountered a cell infected with a virus or that it has become cancerous, the memory T cell activates to form cytotoxic T cells, which then hunt for the diseased cells. Once the cytotoxic T cells have fought back against their targets, the majority of them die, with a few returning to a dormant state to maintain the memory of the threat. Sometimes an activated cytotoxic T cell doesn't die when it should. Instead, it becomes dormant. It grows new surface molecules and loses its activation proteins, making it unresponsive to signals from its target pathogen. As these dysfunctional cells accumulate, they increasingly take up space in the immune system, so that populations of healthy normal T cells cannot develop and expand to take on new threats. But what if we used a vaccine to destroy the unresponsive cells, leaving the healthy cells intact? In one sweep, we could restore the immune system's ability to fight viruses and cancer. Sheathed in smooth muscle, our arteries expand and contract to accommodate the force of every beat of our hearts. Long strands of protein run parallel to one another, arranged in fibers and linked together in a regular lattice. To accommodate the pulse, this lattice can stretch elastically, allowing it to absorb force. Blood carries molecules such as blood sugar as fuel to nourish our cells. Sometimes the ring-shaped structures of blood sugar molecules break open, revealing two very sticky ends. Usually they close again with no harm done, but once in a while they stay open long enough to stick to something. Some of them bind to the artery lattice, and occasionally they do so twice cross-linking two parallel proteins in a disorganized way. That reduces the lattice's overall elasticity, 
forcing the heart muscle to work harder, raising blood pressure. This contributes to heart disease and kidney damage and increases the chances of suffering a stroke. But what if there were a molecule that could break these unwanted crosslinks? Then only the original regular lattice would remain, restoring flexibility to the blood vessels. We need cholesterol. All cells require it to function and it's delivered to our cells via specialized particles in our blood. But sometimes these particles become trapped in the lining of our blood vessels. White blood cells called macrophages clear their stuck particles by absorbing them and processing them in compartments called lysosomes. Here the particles are broken down into their constituent parts for reclamation or disposal. Once the enzymes have done their work, the reclaimed cholesterol is returned to the blood. The problem is, some cholesterol becomes oxidized during its travels. Oxidized cholesterol is poorly processed by the macrophages and eventually overwhelms them, preventing them from even processing the normal cholesterol they absorb. These sick, bloated cells are called foam cells and they attract other macrophages but the newcomers suffer the same fate. As foam cells accumulate, they form arterial plaques, which become inflamed and burst, spewing out blood clots that trigger heart attacks and strokes. But what if we gave the macrophages a new enzyme so that they could process oxidized cholesterol too? Then they would process stuck particles without getting poisoned and bloated and return to healthy function. This would progressively cleanse arteries of plaque that had already formed. Mitochondria are the fuel refineries of our cells, using food and oxygen to create energy that powers almost every cellular function. Here, mitochondria are localized near contractile units within the muscle fibers, supplying the energy for muscular work. Within the mitochondria, a complex dance of molecules harvests the chemical energy from sugars, fats, and other nutrients. While generating power, mitochondria accidentally produce toxic molecules known as reactive oxygen species. Occasionally, these toxins react with the mitochondria's own DNA, damaging genes critical to the mitochondria's functioning. This causes the mitochondrion to cease to function normally, impairing cell function and becoming toxic to the cell it's meant to fuel. The dysfunction of those cells then contributes to the diseases and disabilities that plague those specific tissues with age. Mitochondrial mutations are especially important in the neurological disorder Parkinson's disease and the age-related loss of muscle strength and quality that even active people suffer. But what if there was a backup to the mitochondrial DNA? Using gene therapy, mitochondrial genes could be delivered to cell nuclei, where genes are kept safely away from the more violent cellular processes. When there's a mutation in the mitochondria, replacement proteins would be supplied by the backup copies of the genes. Fortunately, our cells are already equipped to do this. Only a few critical genes are housed in the mitochondria. 99% of all mitochondrial proteins are actually already delivered this way from genes that are naturally housed in the nucleus. The cell will simply use the same machinery to deliver the few missing proteins that the backup genes encode. With all the missing proteins now replaced by backup versions, mutant mitochondria would still function normally and would no longer be toxic to their host cells. These cells could then return to health and normal function.
One of our strongest defenses against cancer is hardwired into the very DNA of every cell. It exists as a kind of fuse built onto the ends of our chromosomes, called a telomere. Every time a cell divides, the telomere gets shorter. Once it runs out, the chromosome malfunctions and sets off responses that kill its cell. When precancerous cells divide, the telomere fuses normally run out before full-blown cancer develops. It's a built-in safety feature. Stem cells produce a special protein called telomerase that lengthens their telomeres before they get too short so they can continue to produce the cells we need. Telomerase is not normally produced in other cells, but occasionally precancerous cells undergo mutations that allow them to make it. This gives those cells the chance to become cancer cells, dividing and dividing until they kill us. But what if we interfere with telomerase in precancerous cells somehow, removing the gene that it's made from, or using drugs that destroy it or inactivate it? Then those cells would die normally, stopping cancer before it starts. Our immune system has its own form of higher education. Immature cells go through a rigorous development and selection process in a specialized organ called the thymus. Once these cells leave the thymus, they are called T cells. They have a unique ability to recognize and fight cells infected by viruses and cancer while leaving normal cells alone. As we age, the thymus slowly shrinks and shuts down. It becomes less and less able to accommodate cellular students, and the graduating class shrinks, leaving the body unprepared for battle against viruses and cancer. But what if there were a way to restore or replace a depleted thymus? Donated organs could be processed, leaving a biological scaffold that would be seeded by cells derived from a recipient's own bone marrow stem cells. These cells would multiply and receive cues from the structure of the scaffold that would guide them to form a new rejection-proof organ. The new thymus would be ready to train a new cohort of the recipient's own immature cells, returning the immune system to its former strength.
And everyone take your seats, please. Everyone take your seats. <clears throat> okay, everybody, uh, before Eric introduces the session, I just wanted to make a very small, uh, brief, but very welcome announcement. Uh, literally half an hour ago, we received some extremely good scientific news. Um, those of you who have been following Sensor Research um, since before Sensor Research Foundation itself even existed, you will know that um, about a decade ago, the very first project, the very first research program that we were able to initiate with the help of um, especially the initial donation from Peter Thiel was to make mitochondrial mutations harmless by essentially putting backup copies of the mitochondrial DNA into the nuclear genome, um, modified of course in such a way that the encoded proteins would be uh, translocated back into the mitochondrion to do their job. And this is an idea that was first put forward more than 30 years ago, but it's an idea that despite quite a bit of initial effort, nobody was able to make work. And when I first came across this concept, in fact I thought of it myself, it's a pretty obvious idea really, um, I came to the conclusion that a lot of the um, despair and despondency and pessimism about this approach was premature and that it was worth having another go. And so that's the very first project we decided to fund. And suffice to say that it has not been quite as easy as I was hoping to make progress in that space. But progress has now been made step by step over the past several years with the help especially of the absolutely amazing team that we have at the Research Centre who work on this, headed by Matthew O'Connor. Okay, stand up please for a second. Um, <clears throat> And uh, I know that at least Amuta is here. Please, yeah, go ahead. Um, uh, is any, any of the rest of the team here? Uh, Amuta is, is the number two in the team and is absolutely indispensable. I have no idea where we'd be without her. Uh, so, yeah, um, what's happened as of half an hour ago is that for the very first time in the entire history of this project, we have got far enough to have a paper accepted in a very nice journal, Nucleic Acid Research which reports on our progress in this area. The headline result in this paper is that we are the first team ever to get two of the 13 um, protein coding genes from the mitochondrial DNA simultaneously functioning in the same cell line. And of course, you know, two is, a, two is equivalent to infinity for mathematicians, you know that, right? So, uh, so uh, this is extremely heartening news and I just wanted to let you all know. Thank you. Very exciting news indeed. Progress is great, so appreciate that announcement. Um, I think we'll continue on here with uh, the next session that is entitled, As Paths to the Clinic Are Expedited, the Distinction Between Development and Manufacturing is Becoming Incre uh, Increasingly Blurred. So I think this is a, a very uh, apropos uh, discussion given our, our last panel where Jean was talking about uh, her work in the academic centers. Uh, you know, the, the early adoption, early development, and implementation of these technologies uh, starts in academia, but it has to migrate and, 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 uh, and uh, extend into industry and get more controlled as, as time moves on. So I think we're very fortunate to have three excellent speakers to support this particular topic. Uh, Sean Kevlihan is the chief uh, executive offer, uh, officer and, and co-founder of Quad Technologies. So he's going to lead off the discussion talking about uh, applications from a, an isolation perspective uh, as they apply to uh, immuno-oncology, and we'll have that immuno-oncology flare through, uh, throughout the, um, the, three, uh, the three discussions. Uh, central to or, or after Sean will be James Brown, who's the Vice President of Corporate Development and Al Deberon, and he will be discussing uh, the opportunity for, for gene editing, again, in the immuno-oncology space. And we'll follow up with uh, Alan Moore, the Vice President of Com and Commercial Chief uh, for Biologics and Advanced Therapies at Wuji Aptech, who will tie everything together and talk about the commercialization aspects and considerations for commercialization. So we'll get an opportunity to kind of walk through early phase 
uh, mid-phase, and then a uh, final phase of tying everything together. So without further ado, I'd like to ask Sean to come up, and we'll start off uh, this session. So thanks very much, Sean. Thanks, Eric, for the uh, kind introduction, and thank you for giving me the opportunity to talk a little bit about Quad and what we're doing, uh, as well as some of the challenges when it comes to user requirements. So um, before I start, we found a Quad technology is focused on really addressing some key, key bioproduction challenges within the CAR-T and TCR uh, T-cell immune therapy process. And so that's what we really focus on in Quad, is building novel and differentiated tools to help address some of the key challenges in the next paradigm within, within oncology. So for some that might not know what CAR-T is or TCR, it's essentially it's a engineered T cell that you can actually train, we reinfuse it back into a patient and it actually goes after a different oncology indication. This has been really a huge highlight that Genotherapeutics, Novartis, Kite Pharma has been leveraging to treat a variety of different oncology indications, ranging from pediatric ALL to AML and a variety of different others. And how this process works is essentially they either do an autogalous or allogeneic approach where they source patient apheresis material, purified T cells, and then transduce those T cells to express what is known as a chimeric antigen receptor or a TCR, which is a T cell receptor. And those are now trained to go after different oncology indications. And so there's a lot of interesting processes within that workflow that I'm going to be discussing a little bit further. So one of the very cool things about this technology is that they've sustained and have published over 90% complete remission of certain leukemia indications. I mean, this is really the next generation on how you treat oncology today. Um, and people have been actually looking at different methods in terms of trying to address non-Hodgkin's lymphoma, Hodgkin's lymphoma, and then there's some preclinical research that's going on with MAJ3 and as MUC1 looking at different sort of solid state tumors and using these, these CAR and TCRs to actually treat other cancers outside of just blood-derived cancers. <clears throat> However, the challenge with this process, it's, it's a pretty arduous process. You're essentially sourcing patient material. You're sourcing apheresis that is not defined, highly variable, and you really need to find that process. And so how this works, this workflow uh, works, is essentially you take apheresis material, which is given by a donor, you typically have to purify T cells, and then you have to transduce those T cells with your either lentivirus or adenovirus, or through an electroporation using and then doing mRNA to then express your CAR or your TCR that's sp specific to that oncology indication. Then you have to expand those T cells using different expansion technologies, typically CD3 and CD28, and then that gets up to confluence so you can go into dosing and then redose that patient's downstream. Now, this research has been going on for quite some time. People say, oh, well, CAR-T just started about, you know, four years ago, but it's actually been going on for almost 25 years. It's just right now that you're starting to get some significant um, ethical dosing within, within a lot of these, um, with all of these patients. It's starting to create a lot of buzz. <clears throat> now, with that being said, I mean, the translational research is really where it started. So that's, you know, folks at UPenn or um, Sloan Kettery, or the NCI have been working on this for quite some time, but translating that into a biotech and a CMC process is not trivial. You know, it's, there's a huge gap and a huge bridge going from something that's within translational research up and all the way to the CMC. And so it's really highlighted within, call it about three different, you know, facets of, of this bridge. So number one is that typically, classically, when you're in translational research, you're working with T75 flask, you're working in a very open system. Um, people have been taking proactive, you know, methods to actually close the system down using, using apheresis and automation and, and essentially doing serum uh, or apheresis and plasma bag transfers. And so people have been marching towards closing that system, but still it ha hasn't been really completely closed as of yet. In addition, you need to have GMP-qualified reagents to really support a lot of these 
clinical trials and these um, GMP and these, and these bioprocessing workflows that you really need to get to the end patient. Lastly, there's scaling challenges. Uh, when you're dealing with autogolus, you're dealing with one starting population that's going to treat one patient. And so there's scaling challenges associated with autogolus, but even more so with allogeneic, where you source from one donor and then you actually have to build a huge uh, manufacturing operation to then you know, treat multiple donors irrespective of HLA dependency. And so bridging this gap is, is is challenging, but really even more challenging is defining the requirements on a, on a field that's constantly changing. And so from product development, on which what Quad has been doing within the space, it's been hard to, to, to really define some of these requirements that, the, that these CAR-T and TCR folks are really marching towards. And so we need to take a step back. We need to look at, okay, how do we really define these requirements and build products that can really streamline some of their research, number one. And number two is streamline a lot of their bioprocessing and really generate some great clinical outcomes downstream. So it needs, as an engineer myself, you have to start off with assumptions and you have to validate those assumptions through literature. And so what we found out and what we know is that the, with respect to CAR-T, depending on who you ask, it's the ratios between CD4 and CD8 could influence efficacy downstream. That's a lot of the work that's done at Stan Riddell and Cameron Turtle's lab at, at the Fred Hutch. Um, in addition to that, they found that more naive T cells actually generate more persistence. So there, people are drawing conclusions that if you have more naive T cells, you can actually decrease dosing and you can actually generate a better uh, response in the clinic. The third thing is that purification is essential. Once again, as I mentioned before, is that you are starting with kind of a gamish, if you will, of cells. And a lot of people are fearful of transducing the wrong cell, whether a B cell or an NK cell. And so you really need to start with a defined population from your um, donor that gives you uh, essentially the apheresis. <clears throat> Lastly, right now, because it's such a moving space, just like Quad, we're, we're actually struggling to catch up because everything is very changing very fast. And researchers and translational researchers are using fairly antiquated technologies that haven't really been differentiated for a while. And to, to that end, there's a challenge when you're doing purification T cell activation um, known as debeating, which actually is a huge headache within the space, which I'll discuss on how Quad's tackling that. So how's Quad tackling these challenges? As I mentioned before, we take a step back. Talk to, you have to talk to a lot of customers, you have to talk to key opinion leaders within the space to understand how the requirements interact with, it, with the downstream product and their CAR-T therapy and as well as where they're going with it. And so we took back and we looked into the literature and said, okay, let's look a little bit more granular at the process. And so Carl June being one of the big major KOLs within the space outlined his process very nicely. This is his NYSO TCR process, very similar to the CAR-T process, and you can see it's broken down into some pretty nice steps. So the steps outlined, as I mentioned before, is that enrichment, you have to define your population. Typically, you're enriching CD3 positive T cells. Perhaps you're enriching CD4 or CD8. Then you activate and transduce those T cells with your, with your vector, expand them, and then you have to do a bead removal step. So this bead removal step is actually a huge hiccup within the industry right now. So what we've been identifying is, is that as you go through the whole process and you have to remove these magnetic beads that you actually use to purify and activate your T cells, you actually suffer from a 30% loss. And so as an engineer myself, a 30% loss downstream at the end of the process is a huge challenge for these folks. And so we said, okay, let's take the bead removal step and see how we can build a platform around that and really understand on how we can enable and decrease that loss as well as enable purification and T cell activation with that same platform. And so what we developed is a novel hydrogel that we call quick gel. Now quick gel allows you to capture and release cells off of substrates. There are actually many technologies you can actually enrich a cell or put, you know, adhere a cell specifically onto substrate, but there's actually not a lot of technologies where you can actually viably decouple a cell from a substrate without any deleterious effects on the end product. And so we took that mantra in mind. So we took that mantra in mind to actually enable the, the ability for facile release of cells off of substrates, whether it be polycarbonates, polystyrene, xenor, PMMA, PDMS, magnetic beads, which is showed on the bar graph to the right, as well as develop a hydrogel that's biocompatible, has been used within FDA processes before, and to really enable some, some differentiated features. And so this is a fully phase change material that allows you to do that facile release of cells from substrates. 
So if you recall, the debating steps of problems. So we understand what the problem was, and then we said, we have a platform to operate quick gel, and said, well, how do we move the beads faster? So if you remember what I said before, is that fast eye release, you can easily release cells off of substrates. So we said, why don't we take a step back, take the existing beads on the market, coat it with our quick gel chemistry, and derivatize a capture protein to the surface to allow high throughput cell separation, except you don't have to have the 30% loss downstream because of your bead removal that's going to adhere cells at the end of the process. And so that's when we formed a product called MagCloud that we actually used to leverage within the research use only market and then parlay that into some G GMP regulated uh, manufacturing with respect to CAR-T. <clears throat> So how we solved bead detachment is a fairly straightforward workflow. Essentially, you take mag clouds, derivatize with a capture ligand that's geared towards T cells. Those T cells, you can use mag clouds with a combination of apheresis or PBMC, and then those T cells would then bind externally to mag clouds that you can magnetically now manipulate and purify those T cells, except the, the added difference is, is at the end of the process, you can depolymerize that matrix and then have magnetically label free cells at the end of the process. And so this is a very fast and easy process, and I can kind of paint on how fast you can actually release cells from a substrate. And so this is a little movie, because I'm, I'm a huge proponent of movies, because they sell, you know, since they say a thousand words. Uh, so these are our mag clouds, spherical in nature, tiny white dots are magnetic beads, cells that are bound to the surface. And so within about seven seconds, you'll see the plane shift, and that's adding the release buffer, and you'll see that quick gel nearly instantaneously disassociate, and you'll see those magnetic beads start to float away. And so this allows you to then clear those magnetic beads without any sort of ca residual carryover or losing your population downstream. So as they say when it comes to science, the proof's in the pudding with respect to the data. Um, proof of concept data is great, but you know, it's really going into de de designing a nice system. And so what we did is we collaborated with a, um, some KOLs at UMass Medical, and we took a essentially a mock system with human umbilical cord blood that would mimic essentially lymphodepleted cells within a CAR-T process. And so what we did is we took biotinylated anti-CD3 with our mag clouds to do high throughput cell separation from a pretty complex suspension. Again, with the added feature at the end of the process, you actually depolymerize the matrix and clear those magnetic beads. <clears throat> so what we demonstrated is, is that from a starting population with umbilical cord being around 6.5%, at least in this case, where normal peripheral blood is anywhere between 40 to 70% of a given fraction, that we started off with a 6.5% positive population, but at the end of the process, you looked at 96% pure with very limited contaminant and uh, residual carryover of magnetic beads, and also while retained very nice viability at the end of the process. And so it allows you to, again, keep high viable cells and high pure cells within the process that you don't have to have that detriment of clearing your magnetic beads downstream of your, of your cell therapy manufacturing process. Now, as I alluded to before, ratios of four and eight could play a difference, so we wanted to build the applications further and look at how do we purify CD4 and CD8 positive populations, because at the end of the day, what the literature has been saying to us is that this might actually play into an effect, so you need to actually build purification tools for CD4 and CD8. And so we looked at doing purification of CD4 and CD8, and um, we got some very nice results that actually active collaborators are now publishing application notes on. Typically, within a given PBMC, you get about 25% CD4. We enrich up to 96% pure uh, without any residual magnetic beads. Um, on the other hand, you look at CD8, where it's about 15%, um, and, they and we'd be able to purify up to 96% pure uh, at the end of the process. So, once again, what we did is we took a, a step back and we looked at the workflow and really understand on how the workflow plays um, in its entirety with respect to T-cell immune therapy and really where the pain points are at the moment. And so what we can appreciate is that, at least on the enrichment side of things, we can define that population a lot easier while actually addressing the downstream issues of magnetic bead removal and clearance. And so that's something that we developed a product initially to, to really tackle um, that challenge. <clears throat> so we wanted to look at it a little bit different. Um, because now we represent one-third of the process, we want to say, well, how far can we take this platform? And we wanted to explore how well we can activate T-cells. And so within CAR-T manufacturing process and with CAR-T therapy, the manufacturing process really 
essentially is a, is a huge function of how robust a therapeutic is at the end of that process. In other words, that you're, whatever tool that you design, you actually directly influence that drug because it's a living drug. And so it turns out that activation is a huge component of this. Um, as I alluded to before is that naiveness and T-cell naiveness is, is distinct and that whether or not you have more naive, naive T-cells versus more T-effector cells could play into persistence. But there's a catch-22 here. Right, is because you need to grow these cells, but you also need to retain phenotype. And as you grow these cells, these T cells become more and more differentiated over time. Right? So you go from naive T cells to T effector T cells. And T effector T cells, really no one within the space really wants because they don't persist very long in, in, in vivo, and that's a huge challenge for them. So we said, okay, how can we make a, you know, a system to couple our proprietary quick gel and allow us to modulate essentially the naiveness of the T cells um, and see what we can get in terms of um, proliferation as well as also still addressing the magnetic bead clearance challenge that people use for T cell activation. <clears throat> so first we wanted to compare and say, okay, let's look at control beads where you actually can stimulate these T cells using control magnetic particles that have those activation markers that are derivatized on it, and then compare it to our hydrogel or quick gel complexes, and then release the beads or do that debeading step and see what we get at the end of the process. And so within the bright field images, you can see on the far right that on the 40X, you can see there's still magnetic beads, remnants within the control beads. Um, so that's a challenge because then they have to clear that a little bit more, but however, within the hydrogel complexes, it's fairly clean, and there's no residual magnetic bead carryover. So then we took it a step further. We want to understand, you know, within the, the culture system, w what sort of mix of CD4 and CD8 cells that we have. Uh, typically within the control bead population, whatever you start with with ratios between CD4 and CD8, you typically end with at the end of your culture. Um, so there's no really influencing factors that you can actually build, you know, essentially a better ratio between CD4 and CD8. And so we compared that to our hydrogel con complex. Interestingly enough, we actually saw preferential outgrowth of the CDA positive population that allows you to get more of a 50-50 split between your, um, your dosing downstream. So this could play into a significant part on how they do their formulation downstream because now you have a little bit more of um, even keel on both cell types between the CD4 and the CD8. In addition, with respect to fold increases of the proliferation of T cells, you can see that it's pretty comparable with respect to the control beads. So we were pretty happy about that. Uh, big difference here, as I mentioned before, is that we're getting a little bit, we're getting much more CD8 growth uh, than CD4 growth in comparison to, to the control beads. Now here's the interesting thing. So the interesting thing, as I mentioned before, is that T cell phenotypes really play into ethical dosing. And so there's some interesting phenomena that we've identified that we're still working on and drawing some, some significant conclusions on, but we've been seeing a trend that based off of our hydrogel, that we've been actually seeing that we have preferential expansion or retention of naive phenotypes. And so to characterize that, you have to look at certain subtypes called CD62L, CCR7, and 45RA, and we've been seeing an uptick on those markers substantially across um, across the board in comparison to the control beads. So this is something that we're really excited about that we're building products towards because now we have the ability, not just within facile release, but also the tunability to actually modulate what sort of phenotypes you need to get out of your end of your process and retain more naive phenotypes so you can actually generate better efficacy CAR T cells at the end of your process. <clears throat> So once again, what I pr present to you is how Quad and how we address really the ebbing kind of changes in requirements that are constantly being reformulated and retaught um, you know, through lit literature. And so what we pride ourselves is working with the KOLs within the space to really understand those user requirements and specifications. Now you can't really, like, really lock down what the true requirements are, and so that's the big challenge, but you can really address common themes within within some of these requirements. And those themes could be, for instance, that we know that retained naive cells um, are important because they have been published pretty extensively, but we don't know what the exact quantity of those naive T, T cells would be after they're transduced to the CAR vector or the exact phenotypes, whether they want T central memory cells or T stem cell sensory memory cells. 
Uh, secondly, we don't understand the true ratio of CD4 and CD8. That's still ongoing um, within the Fred Hutch and some other folks that are f following suit, and so that is yet to be optimized to really understand what the, what the big implications there is. Um, and then lastly, which I really didn't cover too much, uh, most of the industry is focused around autogolous, but there's a huge, uh, also a huge focus with allogeneic, and s those requirements, we don't understand if those are going to be distinct, if they're going to converge on the same requirements, or, they're gonna, or, or really where the industry is going there. And so there's some challenges with respect to addressing the allogenic and autogolous-based workflows. So with that being said, I'm happy to take any questions on the panel, and I'm going to bring up James to, to talk a little bit more about uh, the gene therapy. Thanks so much. Thanks, and it's a, it's a pleasure to be here, a pleasure to be invited. Uh, it's wonderful science going on, and I think we all have a lot of reason to be optimistic. So hopefully at the, the end of my talk here, we'll um, you know, can be even more optimistic. So what we'll talk about today is considerations in gene and cell therapy manufacturing with uh, pathways to personalized medicine. So a little bit about Aldevron. Aldevron supplies critical reagents to pharmaceutical and biotech companies, specifically plasma DNA, proteins, and antibodies. So we really try to partner with um, our clients to deliver what they need to really enable them um, and to give them the basis for breakthroughs in their research and product development. So a little bit of overview of uh, what I'll talk about today. A um, little bit about just what is gene and cell therapy. Um, and why is the distinction between manufacturing and development um, blurred? What are some of the production challenges and uh, some new approaches? And lastly, what does the future hold? Again, hopefully we can just all be very optimistic about the advances going on in the field. So if we go to the source of all human knowledge, Wikipedia, um, uh, we, it's a good place to start. So uh, we define gene therapy as this therapeutic delivery of nucleic acid polymers into a patient's cells as a drug to treat disease. And cell therapy is a therapy in which cellular material is injected into a patient. And I think that's a, those are pretty good places to start. Although even now, um, as Sean alluded to, we have um, allogenic cell therapy. So even this isn't exactly right because we can have gene therapy that is delivering uh, someone else's cells into the patient to, as a drug to treat disease. So even uh, Wikipedia gets behind sometimes. So what are some of the disease targets that we can go after with uh, gene and cell therapy? Well, there's a lot of them. And I've tried to put up just a few here to describe um, diseases that are re related to aging and, and regenerative medicine. Um, obviously, we have ALS, um, cancer. Uh, Parkinson's disease, there was a company, Neurologix, that pursued that. Uh, they're no longer around, but they made some uh, good progress on understanding how gene therapy could work in, work in that disease. Congestive heart failure, there was a company, Celadon, that pursued that. They're not around anymore either, um, but they've made a lot of advances in understanding um, how we might treat that disease. OTC, which is ornithine transcarbamylase deficiency, was one of the first diseases to um, be treated with a gene therapy approach. Back in 99, there was an unfortunate death in a clinical trial there, um, but we learned a lot from that and, and have sort of are emerging out the other side now as new things are developed. Talked a little bit yesterday about Duchenne muscular dystrophy. That's an active area. Uh, Age-related macular degeneration, certainly something that is relevant for regenerative medicine. Um, there was a company, Avalanche, which uh, emerged with another company now and had some challenges in, in looking at that disease as well. And we have cystic fibrosis and hemophilia. And I was thinking last night about, um, we were discussing that there needs to be more failure, right? That um, uh, we need to fund more speculative research and stuff. And I thought, well, if, if you're looking for a failure, then gene therapy is the right place as far as 
uh, some of these different programs. But that's, I think that's great because a lot of smart people spent a lot of work and people gave money and, and funding and whatnot to look at these things. And we need to continue to do that because that's the only way we're going to make progress. So let's talk a little bit about uh, direct delivery and cell-based delivery. You've seen variations on this slide uh, elsewhere, so I'll be, be quick about it. We, in both cases, we have some therapeutic gene, um, and we're going to make some vector. And in the case of direct delivery, we're going to deliver that directly to an organ, could be various routes of administration here. Um, in other cases, uh, this shows adult stem cells, but they can be, as you've seen, T cells or or other types of cells, we're going to extract those from the patient. <clears throat> we're going to modify them with this virus, and then the genetically modified cells go back into the patient. So these are the, the two different paths we're going to talk about. So when you talk about direct gene, uh, direct gene therapy successes, um, talk about a unicure with lipoprotease lipase deficiency. Um, that's one of the only two gene therapy drugs on the market now. Um, Spark is making some real progress with inherited retinal diseases. Um, Biomarin is uh, making real progress with uh, their hemophilia drug. Um, and GSK with Strombellus, the second gene therapy drug. This actually should be on the cell-based therapy slide, um, but they're making a lot of success here too. So I think that the key here is there's a lot of interest in the field and there, there's a lot of progress being made. If you look at cell-based therapy success, so although it's not gene therapy, Dendrion with their Provenge made uh, a lot of lives better by treating prostate cancer. Um, Bluebird Bio is making a lot of progress with their LentD and other programs. And of course, we talked about Juner, Juno with their ALL um, program. And I think what this is telling us is that there's um, a good problem to have in that we're facing these biomanufacturing problems because we're seeing a lot of success in the field. So we talked a little bit yesterday about the costs and some of the challenges. And when we think about um, biomanufacturing, you know, these are one of the things that you want to help address. So in the Strombellis case, they just announced that the cost will be about $665,000. Now you do get a money back guarantee with that, but that's still quite a bit of money. Um, with Unicure, it's Glybera came out at $1.1 million, and a few months ago they also announced that they weren't going to pursue this uh, in the U.S. They weren't going to go for FDA approval in the U.S. So, you know, these are challenges that you face when you have these very expensive therapies. And then, as I was listening to Deb Miller last night talk about Duchenne's, um, you know, what, what would the Duchenne muscular dystrophy treatment cost? Because in this case, you need a lot more viral vector than you do with either of these cases. So, so that's going to be very expensive, too. So these are some of the things that we need to address. <clears throat> so as an example of direct delivery, um, we have here the, the method by which we're trying to treat inherited blindness. So what happens here is we have um, the insertion of a needle into the eye and <clears throat> usually there's a light probe to help guide the needle and then the new gene in this viral vector enters the cells and then the cells produce enzymes that are designed to treat some disease here so this is the the direct delivery method so if you look at the products for the direct direct delivery how do we get uh, what we need to treat these diseases one of the key, the key element is the viral vector. And the way that's produced is with plasma DNA, and there's actually can be three or four different plasmids for the production of a given viral vector, and live cell factories, so either 293 or HeLa or other cells here that combine not only to produce the viral vector. And this is the material that we provide to our clients, and we spend a lot of time working with them to you know, develop the high-quality reagents so that they can produce these vectors. And if you look at um, cell-based delivery for cancer, uh, we've seen this uh, slide previously, but we're taking cells from a patient, then this ex vivo cell processing, we use a vector to transduce them, and then 
proliferation and then readministration back into the patient. And this example is with the anti-CD19 cells. But again, we've got this viral vector here, so this is sort of the common element between these two approaches. And again, we have the same methods of producing this viral vector. So when you look at this you know, complicated process of administering these gene therapies, you know, the question can be, what is the product from a quality perspective? So if we follow the green path, clearly the viral vector is the product because that's delivered directly to the patient. In the case of something with T-cell therapy, uh, certainly the T-cell is the product. Um, the viral vector is close to the product, and, and these two components are even further away from the actual product. So given that live cell factories, you know, with 293 cells, they have a history, and you have to be very careful with um, the production methods and such, uh, it's pretty well accepted that these need to be produced at a GMP level. Um, but the question is, you know, can we look at these other components that go into a viral vector, namely the plasma DNA, and look at different quality levels for different applications in order to essentially identify opportunities to reduce cost and timeline. So one of the things that we've developed at Aldevron is this concept of GMP source. So GMP source has a lot of the elements of full GMP manufacturing. Uh, there's environmental control, segregated manufacturing, rigorous QA, QC assays. But there are aspects of GMP, uh, environmental monitoring, primary and secondary operators, customized batch records that aren't part of GMP source because in some cases, GMP source is sufficient to provide a high quality product for some of these processes, especially in early clinical trials. The other thing that we provide for our clients is a consistent manufacturing from research through clinical. So the blue um, arrows here show our research grade service, which is the process by which we make plasma DNA. So we have growth, lysis, purification, and QC testing. These other service levels, GMP source, we have cell banking and screening, we have quality review, manufacturing reports, and then with GMP service, we have more process control here, client-specific back records and development work, but what we provide clients with is a consistent manufacturing process. So as they go from early research um, through early clinical trials and even through to commercialization, they can at least rely on the fact that the plasma DNA is going to be produced in a consistent manner. So some of the challenges that we face in providing these materials to our clients are scalability and capacity. And this goes for plasma DNA and viral vectors as well. Prior to Aldevron, I worked at a gene therapy company, Regenex Bio, uh, working on uh, viral vectors. So with plasma DNA, we're looking at a variety of different options, you know, that provided by groups like Thermo Fisher and, and whatnot to scale and add capacity. So we're looking to move to larger single-use fermenters. Um, we're exploring new methods like continuous fed batch fermentation, which is, which is not necessarily uh, initially something you would do with E. coli, but, but that's something we can take a look at. And we're looking at optimizing cell lines and conditions so that we can make a better product here for less money and, and more quickly. On the viral vector side, there's a variety of groups out looking at highly scalable methods, including um, baculovirus and SF9 cells. A lot of the early work in viral vector production is based on sus um, adherent cells, 293, and there are groups looking at suspension adapting these cells to have a more robust and scalable manufacturing process. We're also looking at packaging and producer cell lines. Again, we can do those in a bioreactor and make the whole process more scalable. And in cases where we want to keep with adherent cells, there are a lot of groups out there looking at hollow fiber and microcarrier bioreactors to, again, get this surface more dense 
basically packed in, in a given volume so that we can scale the manufacturing process with adherent cells. Another area is uh, quality control. So this is something we're, we're very concerned about. And I wanted to highlight just a few of the areas that we're, um, we work in that we partner with our clients to make sure that we're delivering quality materials that are going to be used in their products so that they can rely on um, what it is we're delivering. So one is homogeneity. So when you look at some of these assays, you're not looking at just the specification. In the case of homogeneity, you need highly uh, high percentage of supercoiled plasmid DNA to get good transfection, but even the assays to do that. As these plasmids get larger, it becomes more difficult to, to do some of these assays. So there are groups out there and companies looking at HPLC and other different ways of doing um, AGE to determine homogeneity. And endotoxins, we're looking at faster and less expensive ways to do some of that testing. And of course, purity, we're always concerned about um, genomic DNA and other proteins in the plasma DNA preparations. Also in the case of viral vectors, we're looking for purity, um, potency, we're looking to reduce empty viral capsids. So sometimes these capsids don't have DNA in them, so they're not effective. Looking at adventitious agents and consistent production with different methods. It's sometimes the case in biotherapeutics uh, that the process is the product. So how do we look at different manufacturing methods and compare them and understand what the differences are? Another area that's uh, an active <coughs> research uh, within the field is minicircle DNA and nanoplasmids. So here's a case where you have DNA and you're going right into the cell that you want to transform, maybe through electroporation or something else, and you avoid the viral vector altogether. So in the case of minicircle DNA, the advantages are um, we don't have any antibody or bacterial sequences we get more efficient gene transfer um, when we avoid the viral vector, so that reduced cost of goods and time to, to market. Some of the challenges are less efficient production. Um, you need a specialized bacteria strain, and sometimes it's difficult to separate the parental plasmid from the minicircle itself. So you can hardly pick up a... Uh, journal or a trade publication and not uh, hear more about CRISPR-Cas9. So as opposed to the, the viral vector side of things, um, we also produce proteins for our clients and enzymes, including uh, Cas9. So briefly, with, with CRISPR-Cas9, we have the ability to cut specific DNA sequences with this guide RNA, and then by applying a donor, NR, donor DNA, facilitate repair so we've delivered this new sequence to um, this, the gene. So th there's a couple companies, uh, CRISPR and Intellia, among others, that are pursuing this. And some of the challenges here are very similar to some of the challenges that we're helping our clients with on the plasma DNA side. So how do you deliver the Cas9? There's, uh, you can deliver it via protein, via the DNA, mRNA, and some people are even using viral vectors as the delivery mechanism for Cas9. There's Cas9 variants out there for specific tissue targets. So what Cas9 is um, appropriate for a given tissue? And what are the off-targets effects? And how can you, through the way you manufacture Cas9 or design it, reduce those off-target effects? Another area is messenger RNA, which has uh, gotten a lot of press recently with companies like Moderna and PhaseRx, basically in the process of <clears throat> transcribing DNA into mRNA and then translation into protein, let's say, okay, we'll use mRNA as the drug here. And the advantage is here, you get dose-dependent expression. Um, there are previously undruggable pathways that you can approach with this method. And very fast development. So one of the strategies of these companies is to be able to create these new therapies um, and get them to the clinic and then commercialize them very quickly. Some of the challenges which 
these companies have developed their own special sauce around is immunogenicity. Um, the expression is transient, so you have to continually administer the drug. It does require a linear DNA template for manufacture, so that's another key component that we're working with clients to manufacture at a high quality and an appropriate level for their use as they go through their development of, of the mRNA. And it requires several enzymes for manufacture, and this is another case where we're working with clients to produce those enzymes at the appropriate quality level so that the cost and timeline is appropriate for their development pathway. So coming up here, you know, we're really talking about sort of personalized medicine and how this biomanufacturing process is going to work. And with personalization, you're really talking about options, right? If you go to Dell's website, uh, you know, you can pick every aspect of your computer, the hard drive size, all of these different things, and that's because it's your own personal computer and you want what you want. And in the case of medicine, you have a unique genome, maybe your cancer has a unique uh, phenotype, and you need a product that's going to be for you, so you need options. But with options come complexity, and it's just now that we're getting the tools um, and the expertise to figure out this complexity and really design some of these treatments for individuals. So I was a little uh, unnerved to hear that this is being recorded because I'm going to make uh, predictions about the future and, and somebody's going to play it at some point and, and see if I'm right or not, but, but here goes nothing. Um, so if, you have a, if you're a patient, we're going to identify the gene sequence that we want to deliver, um, find the delivery target, is it a tissue, is it the brain, is it, can we just administer it intravenously, and what is your immune state? Because again, if we use viral vectors for direct delivery, um, say to your liver or something like that, if you have pre-existing immunity to that vector, that's a problem. It's not going to work for you. So a little shameless self-promotion of uh, the logo here on these uh, vials, but um, once you've identified the sequence and the immune state and the you can almost imagine like a huge factory, right, where you've got all of this automation, you have the information from the patient, all that comes into the factory, and the factory then pulls from each of these different um, categories the appropriate gene sequences, the appropriate plasmids, puts them together, and what you get out is a truly personalized therapy. So what's the ultimate goal? So we could have, you know, a hundred, maybe even thousands of gene targets that we've identified. And we have different delivery methods. There's a variety of viral vectors, new ones being invented and discovered every day. Um, other methods like Cas9 and the mRNAs and things like that, a variety of ways of delivering. So we have a matrix of options for personalized treatment. So there's this, it could be 10,000, 100,000 different options here. So with all these delivery methods, and let's just focus a minute on the, um, the viral vector piece. <clears throat> so you've got 10 different viral vectors, all of which have been part of a clinical trial of some sort to treat some disease with gene therapy. And you've got a set of genes that have gone into some viral vector and shown to be efficacious and, and provide um, a benefit to the patient. But what you want to do is combine one of those genes with one of those viral vectors that's never been combined before. So you've created a drug that has never been tested on an animal, never been into a human before. But can we manufacture things well enough and do we understand each part well enough that we can say, yes, we can give that to someone to treat their disease? And that's really the ultimate goal of all this is is creating drugs which didn't necessarily exist before you showed up with your disease, but now they're designed for you. And some of these biomanufacturing problems that we've discussed and, and we'll, we've discussed previously at the meeting are, need to be solved in order for us to get to this point in, in development. And at the end, um, for us at Aldebaran, it's all about our clients' clients. So we provide, like I said, these... Um, services to our clients who then go out and, 
and create transformative therapies with severe unmet needs for people like what we see here. So Corey is, oops, Corey is uh, a young man in I think about 2008, 2009, Nine received one of the first ocular gene therapies for uh, a disease called Leeward congenital amaurosis. He was, you know, for all intents and purposes, blind, couldn't walk through a, uh, a maze, and um, a year later, he finished his first season of Little League. Um, it's a very heartwarming story. Emily was one of the first recipients of immunotherapy for cancer, part of the Carl June trials, and now she's four years cancer-free. Um, she had essentially weeks to months to live when she participated in the trial. So what we need ultimately is more pictures like this. So I appreciate your time and appreciate the opportunity to speak. <laughs> now I'll turn over to Alan, who uh, we've worked together in the past. It's, it's great to uh, be, be here with you. Hey, well, first I'd like to thank the organizers for the opportunity to present today, the SENS Research Foundation and Jerry, who was helpful with all the logistics. Uh, secondly, I'd like to say that I am a cell biologist, immunologist, in the same sense of the word that a woodpecker is a carpenter. So save your hashtag questions for some of the distinguished speakers that follow or have preceded me. Um, <laughs> I'd like to tell you a little bit about, uh, let's see if I can get this working. Yeah, I'd like to introduce uh, Wuxi Aptek, uh, and uh, I know Wuxi Aptek is not a household name, uh, particularly in the space of advanced therapies, so I wanna spend a little bit of time telling you about what we're doing. Um, and then uh, my challenge is to cover all of the challenges uh, of manufacturing these innovative products. And, those include the facilities, the chain of identity, uh, scheduling and logistics, the quality control paradigms, the process development that is required to get to a commercializable uh, process, and also uh, the manufacturing partnerships that are gonna be critical going forward given the complexity of these products. And I'm gonna do that through the lens of a uh, autologous, CAR-T immunotherapy that's uh, being manufactured in our, in our facilities. Um, Wuxi uh, was founded in 2000, has grown very rapidly to uh, include 12,000 employees and more than 5 million square feet of laboratory space. And it's speckled all around the, the globe, uh, including uh, Reykjavik, Iceland, where the decode genetics and the genomic programs are residing. Uh, our sites in Philadelphia are the center for uh, excellence in biomanufacturing and biologics testing, and we participate uh, in uh, other activities such as uh, supporting combination devices and medical devices uh, with our St. Paul facility and our Atlanta facilities that are providing sterility assurance services. Um, Wuxi is uh, committed in a large way to cell and gene therapy. And uh, we're supporting programs that represent both uh, large multinational pharma companies as well as biotechs and small innovative companies. About 2,000 and spanning 30 different countries. Um, in terms of uh, what we're doing in Philadelphia, uh, we've set up an integrated service uh, within the Philadelphia Navy Yard to provide for both manufacturing and quality control testing and analysis of cell and gene therapies. Um, we have uh, initially uh, utilized uh, the first facility in the Navy Yard, but have now brought on two additional uh, facilities that are earmarked for the production of these very uh, uh, complex products on a commercial basis. And so these are large-scale facilities. Our, our services span the development spectrum uh, from discovery uh, to preclinical and hopefully uh, clinical and commercial. And we're supporting phase three manufacture 
of uh, advanced uh, therapy products right now for use in the United States, Korea, and Europe. I mentioned uh, Wuxi's commitment uh, to, uh, to this uh, very exciting area. Um, our initial investment in 2004 uh, was uh, to build structure for the production of uh, autologous and allogeneic cell therapies and the associated biosafety and quality control components that were required for those products. Um, we recognized as our clients' products advanced that these facilities were going to be inadequate. And so uh, we, in 2014, uh, started construction of a 45,000 square foot facility for allogeneic and autologous products uh, that do not include the use of viral vectors. And as excitement in the CAR T space uh, was expanding, uh, we were committed by our management to enter that field, uh, and I had the headache of making that happen. Uh, and uh, we concurrently uh, broke ground on a new facility, 150,000 square feet, that is earmarked for commercial manufacturing of CAR T products and viral vector manufacturing. Um, these facilities, and FDA has very specific requirements, uh, these are uh, products which require aseptic processing, um, and we must meet those aseptic processing standards in order to release products and to, to uh, pass a pre-approval inspection by FDA. It turns out that the U.S. has been more lenient than the EU in terms of their requirements for clean rooms. And so uh, we took the decision to build all of the new facilities to meet the EU standard. And this uh, requires a greater expense, uh, greater stringency, but it is, uh, in our minds, the most, uh, the most appropriate way to move forward. Um, uh, cell therapy covers a very broad field. You've heard lots of different terminology. I'm going to be talking about CAR T cells, which uh, uh, we describe as gene-mediated cell therapies. Uh, and we're using gene-mediated cell therapies uh, to also describe products where there is gene editing involved in cellular expansion. Um, as you heard from Gene this morning and uh, uh, certainly from, from others that will follow, there is complexity associated with all of these different kinds of cellular therapies. Um, the, the, the requirements for control of a manufacturing process that's driving uh, cells to differentiate to pancreatic islet cells is very challenging as well. And it has different ramifications in terms of facilities, staffing, and scale-up. Um, from a manufacturing perspective, uh, allogeneic products have a commercial advantage in the, in the context that you can make lots of patient doses from well-characterized banks of cells, um, and you can deliver more uh, patient doses to the, to the, uh, to the patient. Um, the autologous products, though, uh, increasingly have yielded results that are very stunning in the clinic. And um, just, I think, in an article in the New York Times yesterday, Steve Rosenberg said, we are going to get to the point where we're going to be excessively personalizing these therapies. So we believe that the autologous products are going to be on the horizon for, for a good while. Um, the autologous products have a whole set of challenges. It includes um, uh, limited amounts of material that one can test, source variability, and uh, often the fact that these cells have to get back to the, to the patient very quickly, in which case uh, we need to use rapid test methods and to quickly review and release product under GMP. Um, this is a different cartoon, and I apologize. You're going to see some si similar graphics across our slides. Um, but uh, this maps out a gene-mediated cell therapy, uh, whether it's an autologous or allogeneic cell therapy goes through a, a very similar process in terms of collection of cells, selection, uh, ultimately the transduction with the viral vector, uh, and then harvest of those cells. We're also supporting cells which uh, start from the source cell bank, are genetically engineered, and then are used for expansion and harvest and given to the patients. Um, when we looked at bringing in uh, CAR-T manufacturing into our manufacturing environment. 
there were two issues that stood out as uh, requiring the most attention. One was the ability to appropriately handle the retroviral or lentiviral vectors that were being used as part of the transduction. And the second was ensuring adequate segregation and chain of identity for individual patient products in that same environment. Um, we took the approach of establishing uh, multi-workstation uh, suites, aseptic processing suites, and having a very careful mapping of activities within those suites. And this is an example, it shows you four workstations within an aseptic uh, processing environment and uh, mapping of workflow across the different workstations to shared equipment. And needless to say, much of the equipment is expensive. And so where possible, we want to use shared equipment or shared workstation space in order to get the highest throughput through the facility. Um, and this requires a good deal of discipline. It requires training so that our operators understand the temporal segregation requirements and the non-overlap in important unit operations. Uh, FDA expects that we as a manufacturer will have uh, adequate procedures to ensure that cells collected from a donor uh, go back to that same donor after they've been processed. And it sounds simple, but the reality is there are lots of places along the way that require a good deal of attention and special processes in order to accomplish that. Um, we've broken it up into a program for each individual project product that we support and looked at various quadrants such as the way that we segregate activities, the way that we label materials, samples, derivative samples, uh, the way that we uh, monitor the process and verify that the uh, chain of identity is being maintained, and the storage and transportation of those materials back to the individual patient. That necessarily requires, requires us to be in communication and to have coordinated planning and project management with our clients and their clinical team. So it, it is a very challenging uh, task, um, but it is one that has successfully been implemented. And for each new product that comes into our facility, uh, we establish a cross-functional team that evaluates the workspace, the equipment requirements, um, does essentially a gap analysis, and then looks at filling those gaps with uh, individual processes or procedures that become part of the overall operator training. And we train not just the operators, but the logistics staff, the quality control staff, the analysts that are, are receiving these samples so that there is a, a comprehensive appreciation for maintenance of the chain of identity. And this documentation ultimately ends up in, in regulatory documents supporting the product. Um, I'm not going to describe the T-cell process. I'm going to talk a little bit about the mechanics of how we uh, carry this out in the laboratory. And I think um, it's, it's important to recognize that in this uh, processing, uh, there, is, there are variable steps and fixed steps, which make capacity modeling uh, somewhat challenging. So uh, we're often informed by the clinical team as to the expected arrival of apheresate uh, coming to our facility, which means that we have to have the appropriate resourcing available and the day zero processing team, qualified operators who are ready to, uh, to attack that. Um, more often than not, there is variance there, either because of the patient's health uh, or uh, scheduling with the clinical site. So we have to be on call for uh, receipt of these materials. Um, the uh, transduction, activation, uh, and expansion of the T cells is more uh, routine, uh, more of a fixed uh, time period. Um, but at the end of the day, there is patient-to-patient -patient variability, which translates into uh, longer uh, periods of time or shorter periods of time. And we have to make sure that we have the resources to uh, to support that prior to the harvest and the quality control release and delivery to the clinic. So overall, we have a complex process, a complex technical process, which has both fixed and variable components that makes the challenge of having the resources available 
um, challenging. Um, as uh, I think James pointed out, uh, these are individual GMP products, and therefore we have to treat them as individual GMP products in our documentation. I, I mentioned that there is short notice requests received, process variability, and the challenges in capacity modeling. And this is, this is actually made even more challenging given the fact that we are producing these cells in a qualified aseptic processing environment uh, which has been qualified with a defined number of operators. And therefore, if we're sloppy in the scheduling, uh, we can have overlap, which would require more staff than can be supported in the manufacturing suite. And that would be uh, it's not something that we could do in terms of uh, uh, complying with our validation protocols and the EMP cues for the room. So lots of, uh, lots of things to think about. Uh, also, to, just to underline uh, the complexity, uh, these operations are, uh, take a good while. They use complex equipment. Uh, there is the requirement for GMP documentation and verification uh, in batch records. And uh, these are, are folks who are working for extended periods of time wearing sterile gowning. And it's not unusual for operators to be in the suite standing for eight hours in their gowns without a bathroom break. So the reality is we have to uh, take these resourcing considerations uh, into, into uh, mind as we schedule and scale up our capacity. This is a map of a slightly different process that has also a variable uh, unit operation in it. And the way that we are addressing this through the early, or through the early uh, and um, uh, later phase two clinical studies is to put together workstations in multiple multi-workstation suites uh, and to be able to staff with dedicated staffing uh, to accept these products. And it's, it is reasonable for us to use this model uh, through phase three but with some of the indications that we're talking about where there's tens of thousands of patients that may require dosing long term, there have to be better solutions. Um, and one can look at uh, establishing larger and larger aseptic suites or segregation of expansion uh, activities into gang suites. But at the end of the day, uh, the hopes are that more automated processes and uh, more uh, 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 control over the aseptic environment through barrier technology is going to provide uh, better solutions long term. So we're making Model T's at this point. We don't have the robots uh, working yet. Um, this uh, uh, obviously the multi-suite uh, uh, approach does allow for uh, higher throughput without overlap of critical operations. Another challenge is the fact that uh, you have to have the right amount of materials uh, released by your QA unit in order to meet the patient requirements. And when there is uncertainty as to when patients will arrive and what materials are necessary across multiple products, this can be very challenging. Um, many of the products that we're seeing today have extensive bills of material, 50 or more individual components, biological components, uh, as well as uh, um, components used in, in dedicated processing. So maintaining uh, the appropriate levels of these products is a, is a constant headache, and one has to have a very sophisticated system if we're going to be doing this uh, at large scale. And so beyond the facilities, Wuxi has invested in uh, supply chain management and uh, MRP systems to be able to support this. This is how we control the supply chain, and it's obviously a very, a very clear linear process. Um, but uh, this is what is required in order to allow uh, materials to be tested, to go through identity testing or extensive testing, activity testing, uh, and to be released for use in manufacturing. Also, uh, biosafety is a challenge, and building the sampling plans to meet both FDA, EMA, uh, KFDA expectations is very challenging. In some cases, surrogate samples are permitted, uh, as in short shelf life biologics or short shelf life cell therapies. 
where one could take a sample earlier uh, than the final released product, subject it to a rapid testing method, and use that for interim release. Um, with gene-mediated cell therapies involving viral vectors, there is extensive testing required to document the absence of recombinant uh, retrovirus or replication competent uh, retrovirus or replication competent lentivirus. And uh, while there's hope that some of the stringency here will be alleviated by FDA, uh, this is the current requirement and therefore there are uh, extensive um, facilities required to accomplish this testing. Uh, some of this testing requires cells, co-cultivation assays that will be run for 42 days, five passages of cells seeking to uh, cause the, the uh, retrovirus to, to leap out of the cells. So this is a, another complicated component in, in our life. Um, with uh, short shelf life products, and, and uh, many of the products that we're, that we're manufacturing today have uh, cryopreservation steps, and we're developing formulations and cryopreservation processes, some don't. And this is a, a real life example of a product that's dispensed uh, at our facility at, at around noon and is in the patient at two o'clock. Uh, and the coordination of a GMP interim product release between two QA groups and clinical groups is very demanding. Uh, we, we don't necessarily like to do this, but it is possible to, to have this kind of turnover. Um, next, uh, I'd like to talk a little bit about what uh, stands in the way of, of getting there. And some of the folks today have talked about um, the process of, uh, uh, of uh, moving to the late stage uh, uh, robust manufacturing at the, at the phase three or commercial. Um, that isn't as easy as it sounds. And one of the reasons for that is that uh, there is uh, variability of the source cells. Uh, there is limited amount of material which has a clinical correlate available so that uh, processes can be appropriately evaluated uh, or validated. And there are the lack of analytical methods that tie out that allow for comparability. So there are challenges early on uh, presented uh, in moving to a more robust uh, uh, process. Uh, there are, as others have pointed out, also limitations on the amount of time the cells can be stored, their stability, and their, their activity after cryopreservation. In addition to some of the mundane things like, uh, you know, is it a combination product if it's in a syringe, and how do we evaluate the device components associated with that? Um, and lastly, uh, in terms of being able to characterize these products, uh, we find that many do not have uh, uh, robust potency assays. In many cases, they're surrogate potency assays which are being employed. And so all of those present hurdles as we look to move towards developing a robust commercial process. Um, we've, uh, we've accommodated this and uh, we have had clients who have said, uh, I'm going to stick with my non-robust process uh, until I've gotten approval for the product. And then I will launch the process development activities for the commercial process. We've had other companies which have said, we need to do both an early development uh, PD as well as a late development PD, and we're going to overlap them as much as we can and factor the materials that we need to accommodate that process development effort uh, uh, as we're going. Um, so we've seen uh, both ends of the spectrum. Uh, the challenge for us is to have both of those capabilities available to a client simultaneously, which means that our, our, our process development staff has grown over the last year by 200%. Um, and then talking about the way that one might partner, uh, these products uh, by and large have the regulatory skids greased uh, in one way or another. Uh, clients come to us and say, we're in phase one now or phase two, but we can very quickly go to commercialization. And that presents a challenge. We need to have available 
uh, the resources to support a rapid commercial transition. We also have to have capacity, and when one is entering into a commercial manufacturing agreement uh, with a pharma company, there's a little bit of paperwork involved. So uh, these things do add uh, complexity, and the standard approach that's been taken in the past with CMOs of, uh, I'll give you some, uh, some money and you give me a product, doesn't work very well. Um, the other challenge that we see and, and have to address is this compressed window of time for process development and analytical development. And often, analytical development is gating our progress in manufacturing. Uh, so they have to be attacked simultaneously. And then lastly, our facilities have to be flexible because forecasting uh, launch quantities and, and market penetration for these products, there, there are few precedents. So being able to have facilities which are modular and can expand uh, to meet scale up is gonna be important. So we've developed uh, strategic manufacturing partnerships uh, where we are able to dedicate uh, suites, we're able to expand in modular fashion as the product demands uh, uh, increase and able to leverage uh, existing quality control, analytical methods in order to be able to keep this complex process on, on track. Um, and to some extent, and to much credit to the senior management at Wuxi, uh, we have pre-positioned facilities uh, which are built to commercial standards uh, with the faith that many of these products are going to advance rapidly. And uh, we've already um, uh, signed under agreements uh, manufacturing contracts for products that are in late stage clinical studies right now. So it's a very exciting time and uh, while uh, I'm getting lots of gray hair from addressing challenges here and, and working with our team to address these, uh, we do want to keep in mind, and I'm going to show that slide, uh, show that picture again, uh, why we're doing it. And uh, as James pointed out, this Emily Whitehead, she was the first ALL patient uh, treated at the Children's Hospital uh, in, in Philadelphia. And uh, she's happily uh, holding a puppy there after four years of cancer free. And uh, there is a, uh, an Emma Whitehead Foundation if anyone is, is interested in visiting her website. Um, and uh, lastly, I'd like to thank the folks who are, are working every day addressing these challenges, putting in long hours to uh, uh, to support the, the active manufacture of these immunotherapy products and, and the clients, teams that, uh, that we work with. And with that, I'll say thank you. About 15 minutes. Why don't we go up and then we'll, we'll decide from there. Thank you. Well, thanks very, very much. Uh, great uh, ending there, uh, Alan. Really appreciate it and brings me back to the days of uh, doing that sort of work myself. Uh, very complex. We can see the difference between uh, early phase development and the requirements for commercial or getting ready for commercial applications. And these are, this is with a, a product that's actually not commercial even yet, right? So these are just preparations for commercial manufacturing. So you can see the uh, the extent of the development that has to occur and innovation to be able to support the industry. So it's, um, it's really quite eye-opening. Uh, it's very exciting, but also quite, uh, it's almost scary in a way to understand like, how are we actually going to be able to, to manufacture these and support uh, these patients that are, are in such need and that uh, cures, if you want to call them that, are actually available. You know, so, so getting them out there is, is uh, going to be quite a, quite a um, uh, an objective. So one thing that I noted from some of the, the talks here was that you know we're, we're starting to see a lot of challenges and problems that you know we're talking about scheduling challenges and and uh, you know cryopreservation and uh, uh, logistical issues. But to me, this is a great sign, right? This means that the industry is really progressing and we're moving towards great problems uh, to have. There are great problems to have, exactly. Um, you know, one of the, the, the questions that I had was really, you know, and I'll throw it out there, anybody can pick it up, is um, early stage development, 
like where, where Jean was talking about earlier this morning, you know, how does that progress into a contract manufacturing type of a situation? Maybe, maybe Alan, you're the, probably the, the best to, to address that. And, and what kind of additional work? You, you touched on it a bit, but maybe a, a couple of comments there. And I know we're limited in time, so it would be good to maybe take a couple of questions too, but Alan, if you might take sure. that. Well, I, I think uh, Gene made some wonderful points that you know, having that information is incredibly valuable. Um, we've worked with, and uh, we actually um, put in place a collaboration agreement with um, uh, Jim Wilson and University of Pennsylvania around AV manufacturing. And the notion behind that was that uh, that group has uh, done extensive work uh, and developed extensive analytics to be able to support uh, ultimately manufacturing in a contract manufacturer's hands. And we wanted to have uh, the ability to, to uh, parlay that as uh, a lot of vector, uh, a lot of targets are using AV vectors. So I think the, the concept of collaborating with these academic centers of excellence is one that, that makes sense. Um, another uh, precedent, uh, if you will, has been uh, uh, in the uh, monoclonal space, we talked about it being mature area today, wasn't always that way. Um, there were consortiums of uh, industry that worked with, for instance, MIT uh, to understand the Chinese hamster ovary cell, which is kind of the workhorse of uh, recombinant protein production. There may be an opportunity for that. And there are some uh, initiatives uh, in the field that are, that are I think, flirting with this. One is with the FDA and uh, uh, the uh, NIST group, National Institutes of Standards and Technology. They're looking to uh, share information, establish standards, and uh, make that information available to, to industry. Um, I, I think, uh, you know, there has to be recognition that the contract manufacturer, the manufacturer, is not always going to have the expertise and and resources to, to do uh, that, that fine work that's being done in, in, in the uh, academic uh, centers. Mm -hmm. So we just have to figure out a way to get that information in the hands of the folks that are, are going to be using it to manufacture. Yeah. I think the, the collaboration is the right answer because we've you know, worked with a lot of different clients and understanding what their needs are depending on where they're at in their development cycle, and engaging the regulators too. I think that's one of the, the biggest challenges is, you know, there is no approved product in the U.S. There's only two in the Western world. The regulatory pathway isn't clear, and certainly with Glybera, it wasn't clear even when it was done. Um, so that kind of uncertainty is expensive and it's time consuming. Mm -hmm. And the sooner we resolve that, I think the more we're going to be able to move these things forward like from our perspective to understand, you know, what quality level for these different components is required because, ha because it all drives the cost of goods in the timeline. Mm -hmm. Absolutely, standardization, right? Understanding where, where things need to go. Sean, what, oh sorry, go ahead. No, I was just gonna say, and working with the tool providers, it, it, um, it is very helpful to have uh, products which are designed appropriately, uh, that are designed for use in closed processing, uh, the ability to order custom components that can close up a process. And we've seen a lot more, uh, 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 I guess, uh, centralization, if you will, on certain platforms because those tool providers have recognized the importance of that. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, I, I think the tool companies have, have been doing a good job in, in recognizing the need. Mm -hmm. and, and just to build off that, I mean, I think that the formal collaborations between a lot of the key opinion leaders, for, at least for, from a tools provi provider perspective, is crucial and critical. I mean, without understanding, you know, the forefront of their research, it's very difficult, as I alluded to in my presentation, that, you know, to define those requirements. And you really have to work, you know, within the trenches with these guys and building with, with products. And I find that we're, it's, we're in a similar place to where biologics w was back, you know, in the 80s is that, you know, one of the big workhorses in the industry was protein A chromatography in Sephiros. And that took a, a while to develop and perfect and without being, you know, within the trenches to the guys who are manufacturing those biologics. I don't think, you know, those chromatography resins would be here today. 
So necessity drives innovation, essentially, right? So when you see these problems coming up, this is where the opportunity to, to develop uh, new technology lies, exactly. Mm -hmm. Sean, what do you think about you know, new, new technologies that, that are being developed and the ability to support some of these, these uh, potential large requirements in the future? How, how, do, how do, does that uh, allow you to sleep at night? <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I think I'm sleeping just fine because there's a lot of innovators, uh, thankfully, within the world. I mean, you know, from if you know, companies like myself, and given that we're we're fairly small, a lot of a lot of us are very nimble and understand really what the crucial pain points on you know within the market. And so, really, you know, innovating technologies and developing innovative technologies, as I mentioned before, is just a function of working with col collaborators. But like going back to when we were talking about electric aeration, there's a lot of people trying to address that in different methods. When in some instances where, you know, technologies of simply squeezing a cell and increasing the porosity of the cell could then transduce those. So there's, I think there's always more technology to come to the market. It's just building and understanding and building essentially the, the platform and the, uh, the workflow to support those technologies is crucial, and you do that with KOLs and key opinion leaders. Absolutely. Staying, uh, staying connected and uh, making sure we all understand um, what the needs are will help us all uh, drive this, this uh, industry forward. Well, I think uh, if there's an, uh, a couple of some time for a, a few questions, that would be good then. Any questions in the audience? Up, oh, there's one Rebecca. Hi, thanks. I guess this is a little bit more for Wuxi. Um, are you seeing much maturity in the interface in the IND process going into phase, from phase two to phase three, the FDA's interaction with that in manufacturing, uh, and then transitioning on to the proposal for the BLA? Who actually holds the BLA? Um, at the end of the day, because I think your model is a manufacturing model, right? Right. And that seems to be probably not very mature yet. Um, we've experienced that a lot in antibodies, but I'm not so sure in cell therapy that that's a well-developed um, process map. Yeah, there, there is uh, the expectation that the model that's been used for, for monoclonal antibodies, for instance, uh, uh, would, would apply to the cell therapies. Where it gets a little mucky is uh, the extension of uh, the client to the, the sites where the, the materials are being collected and then the delivery back. And where does that uh, authority and uh, responsibility lie? Uh, generally, the uh, manufacturing agreement and the quality agreement, uh, as defined by FDA, uh, uh, it, covers that and it works with the existing VLA mechanism. Um, FDA issued guidance uh, a little while back about manufacturing partnerships and um, uh, clarified that uh, there is a shared responsibility for a GMP manufacturer. Uh, so um, FDA is anticipating that the, the pathway that, that exists uh, will apply to these products. Hope that answered it. Great. Are there any other questions? Is everybody just hungry? <laughs> I think everybody's hungry. So thank you all very much. We'll Great. break for lunch. <laughs> and we'll meet back here at 1 o'clock. And one more announcement. Did anyone lose a, tele lose a cell phone yesterday? Because I'm carrying it around in my purse. So <laughs> if, you if you know of anyone who lost one, let me know.